a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. A service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. of the circus. Jerry of the Circus. Hey, Jason. I thought those two will be good friends. Yeah, but not for long, I'm afraid. Why not? Well, there's always the danger that if the cub gets bigger, he might hurt Rags sometime while they're playing. If no one was around and there was blood or something, the cub might revert to his jungle ancestors. What do you mean, revert? Well, he might forget he's supposed to be a well-behaved wild animal, and suddenly smelling blood, he might think of the kill. Oh, I see, of course. I, I suppose he might. You still think you'd like to train him to be pals? Uh, I should say not. What do you think I am? Guess maybe I'd better take Rags now and... <laughs> I didn't mean to scare you, Jerry. Not much you didn't. No, it's safe enough for them to play now if we kind of keep our eyes on them. But it is true you have to be pretty careful while the crub goes up. Golly, I, I should say so. I suppose they're too little to know why they do certain things. Well, that's it. And too young to be well enough trained so you can trust them. Is Fuzzy too small to start training yet? No, sir. He's just about the right age. Gee, I- I'd like to try what can we teach him? I was planning on feeding him now, so this is just about the best time to start learning something. I, I know, because uh, you reward him when he does the right thing. You hit the nail right in the head, Jerry. Look, here's the little board. Hey, let's make him jump over it. Okay, take these pieces of meat and start calling him. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, kitty. <laughs> All right, be still. I don't mean the kind of a cat you th- think. <laughs> now, come here and lie on. I'm trying to train this cub. Guess I'll call him Fuzzy. He may as well learn his name now. <laughs> Say, you're going to have your hands full. Here, I'll hold Rags. See, they both smell me. Oh, no, I, I manage. Rags will behave. Down, Rags, and not a word out of you. Understand? <laughs> he may behave, but he sure sashes you back. Come on now, Fuzzy. You're Fuzzy. Gee, he's cute. Well, he's got a good nose, all right. But he climbed over the board instead of just. That's all right. Give him this piece of meat. At least he'll know what's coming to him on the other side of that board. Uh, I'll put Fuzzy back on the other side of the board again. Now, Mr. Cubline, let's see you do your stuff. Okay, Fuzzy, come on. Well, that's better. Catching on, aren't you? Though you're kind of hungry, huh? Yeah, he acts as if he hasn't eaten for days. Cub lions eat just like little pigs. And in a couple of months, when they've got bigger stomachs and bigger appetites, you should see them. He hasn't jumped yet, but he certainly has learned to get over that board quick enough. He will. Just give him time. Here, we'll give him this another try. There you go, Fuzzy. Back on the other side. Here, Fuzzy, Fuzzy, Fuzzy. Why, he did it, he did it. Yeah, sure he did, but he lost his balance. His first jump, pretty good, Fuzzy. You sure deserve your meat this time. Hey, careful of my finger. Gee, his teeth are sharp. So are his claws. Cubs can do plenty of damage if they're not watched. 
Say, wait a minute. Golly, he's quick. Yeah, he's not going to take any chances with the rest of that meat. Thinks he'd better get it now while the getting's good. Best you go. We'll try it once more, Fuzzy. Okay. I'm ready. Come on, Fuzzy. Oh, whoopee. Say, that's what I call a real job. Watch out, Jerry. He's going to get the rest of that meat. Fuzzy, get away from there. Frank, stop it. Leave that cub alone. Hey, Jason, quick. Look at those little mutts. Here, get away. My golly, that cub is a scrapper for being such a little shaver. Fuzzy, you're trying to protect his meat. Trying to sprawl all over it, the little pig. <laughs> Poor Rags. Fuzzy can sure put on a vicious looking act. Hey, Rags. Rags, look out. Stop it, Rags. Rags, Rags, stop it. Ah, oh, gee, look, Rags. You little vixen, you. Rags, oh, look, Jason, his leg. Good night. That's a mean one. Right in the joint, too. Rags, oh, you poor thing. Hey, wait a minute. I'll stick Fuzzy back in the cage and help you pick Rags up. This cub is smart enough, but he's too much of a scrapper. Now, as I can see, you'll take plenty of training. Golly, do you think Rags will be all right? I never heard him whine so much. He, you think it's serious? And I'll see you in a minute. Here you are, cat. Now you stay in there. Come on, Jerry. We'll go over to my wagon. I've got a lot of first aid things over there. All right. Oh, there's Patsy. Hello there, Patsy. Where are you going? Oh, no place special. Just looking for some excitement, I guess. Excitement? Say, you just missed plenty of it. What happened? Say, what's wrong with Rags? Oh, he got scratched by the new cub Jason was just showing me. Oh, I'll say he did. Oh, 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 Jason, look. This looks kind of bad. Isn't that tendon torn or something? Look how he's holding that leg, as if he hasn't any control over it. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure yet. I'll have to fix it him up. Ah, uh, gee, it isn't serious, is it? Golly, I don't know what I'd do if anything happened to Rags. I certainly hope not. Come on in here. There you are, Rags. I can, can't tell very well what's what yet. We'll have to put a little iodine in here to be sure it's not infected. You've got to be pretty careful with claws. They can be nasty sometimes. Yes, I know, I know. That's not very nice to take. Poor fellow. There you are, Rags. You're going to be all nice and well. Oh, you certainly do a marvelous piece of work, Jason. Why'd you learn to be such a good veterinarian? You're in a hospital. What do you mean? Oh, well, I was laid up once. And... Oh, you mean that time you had that bad accident in the cage? Yeah, that's it. Uh-huh. Well, all the time I was in the hospital, I learned everything I could about how to protect myself in case of an accident. <laughs> I even used to read books on anatomy. But how do you know about animals? Well, when I learned all I could about people, I got some books from the library on animals, so I'd be an amateur veterinarian, too. I always knew you were smart, Jason, but I didn't realize how versatile you are. What's versatile? Well, that's being good at lots of things. Say, Jason, what are you doing with those sticks? I'm going to put Rag's foot in a splint. Oh, say, is it as bad as that? That doesn't mean it's serious, Jerry. It'll just protect Rags from getting hurt anymore, and it'll make him keep his legs still. Well, that one, anyway. But how'll he do his act? He won't do his act. Oh, say, what'll Bumps do? Well, I don't know. As soon as we get this fixed, you'd better take Rags over and see what Bumps says. You certainly go about that bandaging business professionally, Jason. Good night, Patsy. I, I almost forgot. What? Well, that letter came today. What letter? The one from the bank. Oh. Hey, sure it is. You want to read it? Oh, well, you haven't opened it yet. No, nah, I thought I'd wait for you. Go on and read it. Okay, if you say so. Oh, this is short and sweet. I don't know whether it's going to help us much or not, though. Oh, what'd they have to say? Let's see. Well, this is from Mr. Ross. Yeah, I know. The man at the bank. Uh huh. He says he checked with the clearinghouse that he told us about. That was sure nice of him. He says that particular lock is made by the Brunner Lock Company in Crystal Falls. Jiminy Whiskers, that's something. And he advises us to write them for further information. I'll do that today. Gee, will you, Patsy? Mm-hmm. You're swell. Golly, I'd sure like to find out where that box is Dad had. Well, if there's any way of tracing it, we'll find it. Don't you worry, Jerry. Well, Rags, if you ask me, that's a pretty neat job. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You've got a polite dog there, Jerry. Did you hear him thank me? I sure did. He knows you're trying to help him. Aw, oh, look, he's licking your hand. That dog doesn't have to talk. He has so many little ways of letting you know what he wants. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's a big help for him not to be able to talk, because he pretends he doesn't know what I'm telling him. So he takes advantage of you, hmm? Yeah, but I'm usually on to him. And then he looks so foolish when he sees I won't let him get away with something. Yeah, it's getting late, Jerry. I think you'd better run along and see Bumps and tell him about rags. If Bumps decides not to use him, he'll have to know ahead of time in order to plan his act. Oh, of course. And thanks, Jason, for fixing rags up so swell and... Goodbye, Patsy. Don't forget about that letter. I won't. See you later, Jerry. So long, Jerry. Sorry, old timer, but you better rest this time. Come on, Bob. 
lost his plate. Hey, how's Ray? <laughs> Fit as a fiddle, but raising a rumpus every time I start to leave him here alone. Well, can you blame him? Here we've been telling him the show has to go on regardless. And now that he's got his paw and his splint, we make him go to bed. Oh, it just doesn't make sense, does it, Rags, old boy? <laughs> well, I better get along. Rags, stop it. Quiet now. Hey, hey, Bumps. You think you'd hurt if, if Rags just ran around with you? Well, no, just on the walk around. Rags, you win. Come on, Bumps will take you along. I think it'll get him too excited not to let him work, Bumps. If you don't mind just letting him tag along on the walk around. <laughs> well, there's one thing that dog sure knows what he wants. All right, Rags, we'll do our stuff, even if we are handicapped. Gee, you're swell, Bumps. Hi, Patsy. Hi, folks. Hey, young fella, why aren't you in bed? You mean Rags? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the trooper in him. He insists on going on. <laughs> well, I don't blame him. But do you think it's safe, Bumps? Oh, sure, we'll take it easy. You better watch us, though. We'll have to change our act. No somersaults this time. <laughs> oh, oh, here's a cue. Well, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just like Bumps? He'll have to change his whole routine. He's as proud of that pup as you are, Jerry. Golly, Rags is proud of himself. <laughs> like a kid that's finally got its own way. Well, he can do the boot trick anyhow. Sits on that big show of Bumps as proud as if he was driving along in the front seat of a car. Hey, gee, Bumps shouldn't. Oh, golly, I, I thought he was going to kick him up in the air and let him do some of those somersaults. <laughs> oh, don't you worry about Bumps. Hmm, kind of tricky the way he caught Rags on his shoulder. But you notice he helped Rags land right so not as to hurt his leg. He thinks Rags owned the whole circus. He sits up there for proud. <laughs> Too bad he can't go. <laughs> yeah. Say, look at him sniffing Bumps the ear. Oh, I bet that tickles. <laughs> Bumps is pretending he doesn't know where Rags is. Well, Rags isn't letting him get away with it. Look at him tap Bumps with his good paw. <laughs> look at Bumps hunting over the wrong shoulder, trying to find out what's back of him. Yeah. Hey, what's happened? Oh, gee, Ray bumped his bad leg onto the stage. Oh, why is he lying so still? Do you think he's badly hurt, Jerry? Oh, yeah. I hope not. He just let out one yelp. I think he's playing possum, though. You know, dead dog. See, Bumps is picking him up. Heavens, he surely looks limp. Look at the way Bumps is shaking his head. Oh, I think Bumps is just putting that on for the audience, Jerry. Isn't he marvelous? You think he lost his last friend? He looks so sad. Oh, so it was just a game after all. Oh, I had me scared for a minute. Me too. Look at him run. Here, Rags. Here, Rags. <laughs> Poor Bum's coming behind him. <laughs> oh, oh, well, I'm all out of breath. Say, listen, Jerry. Get Rags over the wagon, will you? I want to have a look at that leg. I'm afraid he really hurt himself when he ran into that stake. Oh, gee, Bumps. Call you. I'd never forgive myself if I made him go on and, and he really got hurt. Well, now, don't you worry, Jerry, but I'll tell you one thing. He doesn't work again until that leg is well.
Pomalate soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High. Well, like many other romantically inclined people, she sent the object of her affections, Madison's bashful biologist, Philip Boynton, an unsigned card for Valentine's Day. And then she sat down to wait for his reply. It wasn't that his reply was long in coming. It just didn't come at all. <laughs> Knowing Mr. Boynton, I wasn't too surprised that he forgot about Valentine's Day, but I was determined to change the locale of our next date. For the past six weeks, we had spent every Friday afternoon at the zoo. Now, I am definitely not anti-animal, but I am a school teacher, and hence, after spending three hours in the monkey house, I just can't afford to buy taboo by the court. <laughs> I was brooding about it in the school cafeteria on Friday when Harriet Conklin walked over. Mind if I sit down with you, Miss Brooks? Not at all, Harriet. But don't you usually have lunch with Walter Denton? Oh, yes, I do. But he's manager of the basketball team, you know, and he's giving the boys an extra skull practice. Really? Whose skull are they using today? <laughs> I hope you're not expecting Mr. Boynton to have lunch with you, Miss Brooks. He told me he was eating his lunch in the laboratory because he didn't want to leave McDougal alone. Oh, don't tell me that frog is sick again. Oh, not actually sick. It's just spring fever or something. It's kind of fun to have lunch without any men around anyway. Don't you think so, Miss Brooks? Well, yes and no. What do you mean, yes and no? No. <laughs> had a real woman-to-woman -woman talk in a long time. You know, Walter Denton is crazier about me than ever. All I have to do is whistle and he comes running. Really? It's the only way to train them. That's what you want to try with Mr. Boynton. I have, but every time I whistle, he opens his lunchbox. <laughs> Sometimes his dog-like affection and constant worship becomes absolutely cloying. Well, I wish Mr. Boynton would cloy me once in a while. <laughs> By the way, Harriet, when Walter takes you out on a date, where do you usually go? Oh, all sorts of places, Miss Brooks. A drive in the country or for a long walk in the park. Or sometimes we go to a movie and hold hands. Do you ever go to the zoo? The zoo? Oh, gosh, no. Except when Mr. Boynton takes us there for his monthly lecture. That's where I've got an edge on you kids. I hear it every week. <laughs> But Mr. Boynton takes you to the movies once in a while, doesn't he? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we went last week. Was it romantic? Oh, extremely. We stood in a crowd of people behind a velvet rope for a while, and then an usher said, there's one down front. Yes? That was the last I saw of Mr. Boynton for three hours. <laughs> I finally got a seat in the balcony. Oh, Charlie, that's a shame, Miss Brooks. You couldn't hold hands at all, could you? Not even with the long gloves I was wearing. <laughs> but about those Fridays in the monkey house, Harriet... I'm it... surprised at you, Miss Brooks. You don't really let Mr. Boynton take you to the monkey house every week, do you? Well, I think it's the monkey house. It can't be the Taj Mahal with all those bananas. <laughs> well, well, if it isn't Madison High's Ferris, may I join this charming bevy of pulsitude? Why, Walter, what a lovely speech. Yes, you are a delightful child, Walter. But if you'll excuse me, Miss Brooks, I'd like to get my entree at the steam table. Oh, can I be of service, Fair Harriet? I'll gladly fetch what you want. No, thank you. But if you'll sit up nicely when I return, I'll pat you on the head. Arf, arf. <laughs> can I get you anything, Miss Brooks? No, thanks, Harriet. Just bring back a roast beef bone and a can of strong heart. <laughs> okay, Harriet. You know, I think it's wonderful the way you kids get along. You're very fond of Harriet, aren't you, Walter? Very. A plus which Harriet's the principal's daughter, and I'm manager of the basketball team. And there are things that I can accomplish quicker if I can get to Mr. Conklin without having to go through regulation channels all the time. What's good about getting to Mr. Conklin so fast? Well, I like getting things done fast that need getting done fast. Uh, like New Jersey's, for instance. Like New Jersey's what, for instance? <laughs> Not New Jersey's anything. New jerseys for the basketball team. Oh, we need them badly. You do at that. The ones the team wore in their last game looked awfully fuzzy. They didn't wear any in their last game. <laughs> but I'm sure the new ones will come through all right. 
I'm taking Harriet out on a date tonight, and I can bring it up casually when I see Mr. Conklin at his house. I don't like to suggest a career for you, Walter, but I have a feeling you're going to kiss an awful lot of babies before you're much older. <laughs> oh, I could never be a politician. I'm too sincere. Oh, but why are we talking about me? You seem to have a problem of your own on your mind, Miss Brooks. Is it that obvious, Walter? I had been thinking about Mr. Boynton, but only in connection with getting him out of the zoo and into my parlor. Hmm, that shouldn't be too tough. What kind of a web are you spinning? Web? Look, Miss Brooks, at the risk of feeling like a traitor to a fellow male, I'll help you plot Mr. Boynton's overthrow. But frankly, I'm kind of hungry right now. Then why don't you eat, Walter, and we can finish building the bomb after lunch? <laughs> oh, say, there's Mr. LeBlanche, the new French teacher. Oh, he ought to know plenty about romance. He's a real Frenchman. I'll call him over. Don't you dare, Walter. When I'm ready to take my case to the United Nations, I'll let you know. <laughs> Besides, I've seen Mr. LeBlanche on dates with Miss Enright lately. So what? Miss Enright goes on dates with anybody. Gosh, every time she sees Mr. Boynton, she makes goo eyes at him. That's not nice, Walter. Miss Enright's eyes are always that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's unethical. Unethical is better than lonesome, Miss Brooks. Oh, Mr. LeBlanc. Walter, please. You I... call me Walter? Yes. Would you be kind enough to come over here a minute? I'd like to talk to you about something very important. Well, you better talk to me, anyway, Walter, because I refuse I to... I bring my coffee along and... Oh. How do you, Miss Brooks? Fine. How do you, Mr. LeBlanc? <laughs> what did... What did you want to talk to me about, Walter? Oh, that isn't important. I'll see you later. Now, that's what I call a real subtle maneuver. <laughs> he's a... He's a funny boy, no? No. <laughs> Wait. Now... Now he's just you and I, Miss Brooks, eh? I'm afraid he's just you, Mr. LeBlanc. I've got to see Mr. Conklin about something. Mr. Conklin? Please, Miss Brooks, I think Mr. Conklin's a fine principal. But do you have to mention him during the lunch period? <laughs> You've got something there. I guess it can wait a while. It's only a question of giving him my weekly dollar. Are oh, you owe him a weekly dollar? For what? It's a long and grim story, but I think I can boil it down to the repulsive essentials. A couple of weeks ago, I took an electric heater of his, connected it in Mr. Boynton's laboratory on an overloaded circuit, and shorted the building, started a small fire, and ruined the heater. Why do you do that? I like sirens. <laughs> Oh, I didn't do it purposely, Mr. LeBlanc. It was an accident. One for which I'm paying at the rate of a dollar a week. And today's dollar day at Madison. <laughs> well, that is too bad, Miss Brooks, but it is not money that causes you to look the way you do today. Is there a sign on my forehead? How do I look today? Well, there are only two things that can make a woman have the look you have on your face. One is an affair of the heart. The other is the meatballs in this cafeteria. <laughs> But, but neither of them is insurable, huh? I'm sure. You haven't eaten those meatballs lately. <laughs> Look, it's nice of you to try and cheer me up, Mr. LeBlanc. Oh, please, but... call me Paul. And I'm not trying to cheer you up. I'm trying to help you. First of all, tell me this. Did you receive any messages on Valentine's Day? Oh, scared. I got one from Zimmerman's Bakery, one from the finance company, a lovely little card from Bertie's Bicycle Shop, in the shape of a pump, that one was. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, yes, a dandy little poem from Sam, our neighborhood scissor sharpener. I think I remember that one. It went, uh, I've applied my grindstone to shears both old and new, but I never met a scissors one half as sharp as you. <laughs> Wasn't that a peachy sentiment for Valentine's Day? No, oh, quite amusing, yes, but not to you, I'm afraid. Because you're not in love with Sam the scissor or Bertie the bicycle. No, my problem is Boynton the biology. <laughs> Miss Wook. Since we have taken me into your confidence, I would like to make a suggestion. You must play, how do you say in this country, uh, uh, you must play difficult to acquire. Difficult to acquire? Ah. Oh, you mean hard to get. Mm. Uh -huh. Precisely. <laughs> now tell me, tell me the truth. When Mr. Boynton asks you for an engagement, do you ever say no? Well, no. But it isn't just because of Mr. Boynton. I'd hate to disappoint 400 monkeys. <laughs> I haven't gone out with him much lately at all. Because he do not ask you. Well, I like that. I am glad. Miss Wolf, there's one way to get a man interested that never fails. You must make him gel out. <laughs> I've tried that, Mr. LeBlanc, but he just, just doesn't gel out very easily. 
Ah, yes, but you've tried it only once. That is not enough. How do the big American advertisings work? A repetition, over and over the same thing. What is it you hear on the radio all the time? Smoke a penny. Again, again. Smoke a penny. <laughs> if you repeat this often enough, you know what happens. Yeah, Jack gets pretty burned out. <laughs> Mr. LeBlanc, I'm afraid Mr. Boynton is too wrapped up in a frog to pay any attention to me. Oh, but of course. I forget Monsieur Le Frog. You know, in France, we have a proverb. Le chemin au cœur d'homme est par son grinelle. Translation? The way to a man's heart is to his frog. <laughs> I don't see what it has oh, to do. Oh, it's so with... simple, really. Here you have a man with his little pet, Monsieur Le Frog. And here you have a woman with her pet, Mademoiselle La Frog. Now, we convince the man that Monsieur Le Frog is lonesome. And where can his poor little frog find companionship? With Mademoiselle La Frog. And when the two little frogs are together, where are the man and the woman? Pricing junior beds for tadpoles. <laughs> No, Miss Brooks, no. The man and the woman are also together. Now you know, Miss Brooks, what you have to do to get Mr. Boynton to be a bat for your dog. No? Yes, I've got to build a better frog trap. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Mr. Le Frog, uh, LeBlanc. <laughs> this idea is a little bit impressive. coming, Miss Brooks. Oh, you look better already. Hello, Walter. Mr. LeBlanc is quite an idea, man. <laughs> we were just discussing a really fantastic scheme. Not only fantastic, but ridiculous and absurd. Walter. Yes, Miss Brooks? Run down to Peterson's pet shop and get me a female frog. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. The makers of Palm Olive Soap are giving away $100,000 in prizes. First prize, $49,000, plus over 4,900 other cash prizes in the big 49 Gold Rush Contest. Hundreds will strike it rich in this exciting Gold Rush Contest. One of them may be you. It's easy to enter. Just finish this sentence in 25 additional words or less. I like palm olive soap because... That's all. Just 25 words or less to finish the sentence, I like palm olive soap because... Then mail your entry right away along with a palm olive soap wrapper. Try for your share of that $100,000 in prizes right now. Your chance of winning $49,000 is as good as anyone. Get entry blank with complete rules from your dealer or write your completed sentence on plain paper. Include your name and address and dealer's name and address. Mail with one palm olive soap wrapper for each entry to Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Better write that down. Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Enter as often as you like, including one wrapper with each entry. Get palm olive soap right away to help win a lovelier complexion and try for your share of the $100,000 in cash prizes. Well, I gave Walter my last dollar to buy a female frog, and while he was out getting it, I took advantage of a free period to visit Mr. Boynton in his laboratory. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. I just dropped in to say hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello. Well, goodbye, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> oh, don't go yet. I've just been examining McDougal. You know, my frog. He's got me a little worried. He's way off his feet, and we'll, we'll look at him. <laughs> don't you think his eyes pop out more than usual? What did you say? I, I said, don't you think his eyes pop out more than usual? Yes. For a minute, I thought he was Eddie Cantor. <laughs> Hi, Mac. Mm. Of course, you know what's wrong with Mac, don't you? Uh, no, Miss Brooks, I don't. Well, it's getting very close to spring, and it's just... After all, you raised him from a tadpole, and it's only natural that you should still think of him as your baby, but he's a big boy now. <laughs> what do you mean, Miss Brooks? Well, just this, Mr. Boynton. Did it ever occur to you that Mac gets lonesome all alone in that cage? Oh, I let him out of the cage quite often. He hops all over the lab. But what good is that? He hasn't got any friends here. Oh, I don't know. There are always a number of guinea pigs around. Of course, he doesn't pay much attention to them. Well, naturally, guinea pigs make fine friends for other guinea pigs. A frog might crave a different kind of companionship. Oh, what about me? I'm very close to McDougal. I've been his constant companion. If I were a frog, I don't think I'd consider that the ideal arrangement either. No, I think I'd want something a little more frog-like. 
But <laughs> what are you getting at, Miss Brooks? Look, did you ever sit down and tell McDougal about the birds and bees? Well, what does he want with birds and bees? He won't even make friends with guinea pigs. <laughs> put it this way. Mrs. Davis, my landlady, has a cat named Minerva. Now, around this time of the year, Minerva keeps us both awake half the night with an almost incessant yowling. Or well, have you tried giving her a saucer of milk? That's not what she's yowling about, Mr. Barnett. <laughs> <laughs> Milk's very expensive, cat is, Yes, I know. And believe me, if I thought it would quiet her down, I'd give her an autographed picture of Elsie the cow. But it won't. She's yowling because she's lonely. Why, Miss Brooks, I didn't know you were so aware of these biological manifestations. Where did you learn all this? My mama done told me. <laughs> I mean, I found out about a lot of things since, since I've acquired my pet frog. Pet female frog, that is. Oh, you have a pet frog, Miss Brooks? What's her name? Her name? Uh, Millie. Millie? Yes, from the picture of the mating of Millie. <laughs> oh, she's awfully cute, too. <laughs> Why, you think Mac almost understood what you were talking about? Well, don't think for a minute he doesn't. What do you say, Mac? Would you like to come over and play with Millie this afternoon? <laughs> Today you are a man, Frog. Well, this is amazing, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Look, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you if... Uh, uh, shine up your hope chest, Millie. Here it comes. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, Miss Brooks, uh, how about a, a double date? That is, if, you, well, if it isn't too much trouble. Shall we say my place for tea? Splendid. Just bring a pogo stick and a deck of cards, Mr. Barnham. A pogo stick and cards? Yes, while Mac and Millie play gin, you and I can have a hopping contest. <laughs> oh, l'amour, l'amour. Excuse me, uh, could you come over here to the door a minute, Miss Brooks? I've got to get to my next class. Oh, certainly, Walter. I'll just be a minute, Mr. Barnham. Did you get it, Walter? Yes, it's in this paper bag, Miss Brooks. Here. Thanks. That's okay. I hope it works, Miss Brooks. Well, I'll see you in English. What's in the bag, Miss Brooks? This bag? Oh, just a roast beef sandwich Walter brought me. <laughs> it's a pretty active one. Hey, look out, it's falling out of the bag. Uh, here, here, let me see that. Uh, yeah, I've got him. Uh, oh, Miss Brooks, do you realize what you've got here? Sure, an F-R-O-G. <laughs> I didn't want to mention it in front of Mac until we got home. Oh, but this I... is a male frog. You, you can always tell. Because in the species Dimorphognathus from West Africa, there's a very apparent dimorphism in the dentition. The male's being provided with a series of large serrated teeth in the lower jaw, which in the female is edentulous. Well, slap me with a wet lily pad. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Boynton, I've got to be running along now. Oh, why, Miss Brooks? I've got to see a boy about a frog. Well, here, here, I'll put it back in the bag for you. Now, just hold the top tighter and he won't get away again. I still don't comprehend why you got this male frog. Well, I didn't know how you and McDougal would react to the idea of keeping Millie company, so I thought I'd play safe and get this one, too. Ooh, ooh. Oh, I don't think Mac likes the idea very much. Uh, don't be jealous, Mac. Let him live his own life. <laughs> We'd better not come over this afternoon, Miss Brooks. I'm afraid it'd only confuse Mac. Look, Mr. Boynton, I don't care if a frog wants to play hard to get. But there's something I'd like you to remember. Well, what's that, Miss Brooks? Well, I don't want to sound too much like an English teacher, but when one plays hard to get too often, one sometimes don't get got. <laughs> now, I'll just take this frog into my room and see how Walter happened to make such well, an awful... Well, there you are, Connie. I've been looking all over for you. Mrs. Davis, what are you doing in the hallowed halls of Madison High? Well, I know how you've been waiting for a Valentine card from Mr. Boynton, and I just had to tell you that all hope isn't lost. But today is Friday, Mrs. Davis. That's just it, Connie. Some mail came this morning that should have been delivered Monday. A Valentine? No, a bill from the gas company. <laughs> now, that's the nicest bit of sentiment since Sam Scissors. <laughs> they say that if we don't pay it immediately, they'll shut off the gas. Just my luck with Mr. Boynton coming over for tea. It couldn't be the electric company promising to shut off all the lights. No, son. <laughs> And I'm short some money or I wouldn't bother you in school like this. You know, Minerva cost me a lot lately with her special diet No. Just how much do you need, Mrs. Davis? Well, if you'll forgive a slang expression, one greenback will do it. I just happen to have one on me. He's in this bag here. <laughs> now, don't look so alarmed, Mrs. Davis. I'm not cracking up completely. Look, just take this frog back to Peterson's Pet Shop and they'll refund my dollar. I'll explain why I bought the frog later. You don't have to explain anything to me, Connie. If you want a frog for a pet, it's perfectly all right. But why are you giving it back? 
To keep the gas on, for one thing. <laughs> Besides, it's a male frog, and I've got to have a female. Well, you don't have to spend any money for that. I'll get you a female frog in the park. I never thought of that. I'd certainly appreciate it, Mrs. Davis. Will you bring it back with you after you've paid the gas bill? Certainly, Connie. And I just know that you'll be very happy together. <laughs> And so, class, you are to have these compositions ready by next Tuesday. That's the end of the period. Class dismissed. Except Walter Denton. Come up to my desk, Walter. Oh, I'm glad you asked me, Miss Brooks. I wanted to explain about that frog. You see, Mr. Peterson was out to lunch when I got to the pet shop, so I got you one out of the park pond. But was it all right? I mean, was she a girl? No, Walter. She was a boy with big serrated teeth in her lower jaw. And what about the dollar I gave you? Oh, here it is, Miss Rook. <laughs> I didn't have time to give it to you before. Thanks, Walter. That'll be all for now, then. I'd better get over to Mr. Conklin's office and make my payment on that heater. Well, here I am, Connie. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Well, what do you think, Connie? Mr. Peterson didn't sell Walter that frog at all. I know, Mrs. Davis. But he said it was a very good specimen and traded me a lovely female for him. And instead of giving us any money, he promised that when our frog becomes a husband, we'll get the pick of the litter. <laughs> I can hardly wait, but where's the female frog? Oh, I had that in a paper bag and it seemed very insecure, so I put the frog in a desk across the hall. Nobody saw me. Across the hall? But that's Mr. Conklin's office. Mrs. Davis, you wait right here, and if I'm not back in five minutes, call the coroner. <laughs> Now, what is it? Come in. Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Please transact whatever business you have in this office in a hurry. I've got an appointment with the doctor. The doctor? What's the matter, Mr. Conklin? Oh, just a checkup. A lot of nonsense, if you ask me. My wife's been telling him all sorts of foolishness about the state of my nerves. To hear her tell it, I've not only got the world's highest blood pressure, but I'm jumpy, anxious, overwrought, but irritable. Mr. Conklin... Don't interrupt! <laughs> And I'm ill-tempered. <laughs> now, what is it you want? I just want to give you a dollar towards the heater I accidentally injured. Here. Oh, thanks. Well, sit down for a minute, and I'll give you a receipt. I've got a regular Board of Education receipt book around here somewhere. But, Mr. Conklin, your desk drawer... Please, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Don't tell me where I keep my things. Of course it's in the desk drawer. Let's see now. Book should be right over here next to this blotter. Oh, that's funny. That's it. Oh, here it is over by this frog. <laughs> Hello, little frog. <laughs> Miss Brooks, it won't take a moment to get the receipt. Hello, little frog! <laughs> Blood pressure. Never mind that. What is this frog doing in my desk? Calm down, Mr. Conklin. Ours isn't the only school that's overcrowded. <laughs> I thought you'd never get home from school, Connie. How long did Mr. Conklin spend bowling you out? Oh, it seemed like hours, but actually it was only a few minutes. You should have been there when Mr. Conklin and Millie here faced each other across his desk drawer. Poor thing, her heart hasn't stopped beating yet. Mm. Neither is yours, Connie. You're as jumpy as Minerva. Are you sure Mr. Boynton said he'd be over for tea? Oh, definitely, Mrs. Davis. I told him all about how lonely Minerva was and compared her to McDougal. So he's bringing Mac over to meet Millie. It's the first time in weeks we've had a date away from the zoo. Oh, oh that's Mr. Boynton now. I'll go make the tea, Connie, and you receive him alone. All right, Mrs. Davis. Coming! Well, it's nice to see you boys. Come in. Let's go into the living room. Uh, thank you, Miss Brooks. Uh, here's something for Millie. It's from McDougal. Oh, I'll open it for her. Well, wasn't that thoughtful of Mac, Millie? Just what you needed, a clump of wilted lettuce. Here, I'll put it in this little box I keep her in. Uh. Oh, I guess Mac wants to see what Millie looks like. Oh, of course. Here, just hold him up. There we are. Uh, uh. This is Mac, Millie. I think she likes him, but Miss Brooks, didn't you say you had a cat on the premises? That's right, Minerva. She usually sleeps in the piano during the day. Here, Minerva, come out of the piano. 
Oh, well, she'll probably wake up in a little while. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Oh, before I do, don't you want to open this big box? For me? Well, what in the world can this be? Yeah. It's a cat, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I brought him over to keep Minerva company. Yeah. Oh. Well, here comes Minerva now. Yeah. like each other, too. <laughs> you by the third monkey from the left. Steve <laughs> Martin, as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only Luster Cream brings you K. Dumas Magic Formula Blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean. Free of loose dandruff. Glistening with sheen. Soft. Manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanent. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Boynton finally took McDougal and his cat and left. Mrs. Davis and I had dinner, and then we sat down in the living room to spend a quiet evening. Minerva went back to sleep, and everything was nice and peaceful when the phone rang. <laughs> Lie down, Minerva. It's not for you. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Minerva. It is for you. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Connolly Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves with Palmolive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim. Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the Palmolive brushless way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palmolive brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the proved Palmolive brushless way. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. The exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these stations. And be with us again next week at this time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Pack of Avalon cigarettes, please. Yes, sir. Oh, just a moment, sir. Don't forget your train. You'd never guess, but Avalon's cost you less. So why not always travel on with Avalon? Good evening, friends. Good evening. This is Del King saying welcome to Avalon time with Red Foley, Jeanette, the Avalon Chorus, and Bob Strong and his orchestra, and the only man in radio who believes there are two sides to every question, his side and the wrong side, Red Skelton. Thank you very much and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That announcement was made by Del King. He's a peach of an announcer, too. You? you can tell he's a peach by that fuzz on his upper lip. <laughs> Say, uh, those are nice-looking shoes you have on, Skelton. Oh, do you like them? They're uh -huh. genuine cowhide. Oh. In fact, they're so genuine, I have to milk them twice a day. 
but they're comfortable, though. Yeah, that suit must be genuine cowhide, too. It's kind of baggy at the knees. Yeah. <laughs> How are you tonight, microphone? Hello, skeleton. I heard you say last week there should be a rhyme for Avalon time. So I wrote a poem for you. Oh, you did? Would you like to hear it? Yeah, I'd like to hear it. You're just a clown. No soul, they say. I know how that makes you feel. But really, Skelton, you must have a soul. One comes with every heel. (laughs) Ah, you don't bother me, microphone. I'm thinking of all the fun I'm going to have tomorrow in my car. I'm going to do a little Sunday driving. You know what Sunday driving is? That's carbon monoxide with detours. (laughs) Well, but what a place Chicago is to drive in. You stick out your hand to make a left turn and a taxi cab runs up your sleeve. I have a nice car. It's all mine, too. All I owe the guy that sold it to me is a grudge. (laughs) Mm. That car is so old, when I took it down to the license bureau, I had to get it upper and lower (laughs) plates. I drove it up an alley the other day, and one garbage can turned to the other garbage can and says, there's that thing I was telling you about. <laughs> Last Sunday, I parked it near a bunch of limousines, and when I came back, it was panhandling park. <laughs> I have a lot of fun in my car, though. It's a nice one, too. It has real knee action. Every time you hit a bump, your knees hit your chin. <laughs> And the Sunday driving is a little different nowadays. Back in the gay 90s, when something whizzed by you, it was a horse feeling his oats. <laughs> nowadays, when something whizzes by you, it's some jackass feeling his ride. <laughs> I met one of those fellas. Thanks a lot, both of you. I, uh, I met a couple of uh, fellas in the, in the courtroom the other day who were reckless. Yeah. <laughs> Well, get ahead of me back there. The, uh, I met a fellow in the courtroom the other day who was uh, up for reckless driving, and the judge says, I'd fine you $100 for driving up a one-way street without any lights, going through a safety zone, hitting a pedestrian, and driving while intoxicated. The guy says, wait a minute, don't that $2 safety sticker entitle me to any privileges? <laughs> well, I've been out here stripping gears long enough, so I'll park and let Red Foley dedicate a song to my car entitled... We've come a long way together. Thanks to the wheel, Foley. You've got a lot of friends out there waiting to give you the right of way. <laughs> We've come a long way together. Since we met on the old village green, we've weathered all kinds of weather, and to me you are still sweet sixteen. Why care if our hair turns to silver? Still have love to keep our hearts aglow. We've come a long way together, and we still have a long way to go.
ever find yourself a little short of cash and borrow a dollar from some good friend? <laughs> I know I have. And if you have too, then you know the value of a dollar. Well, just think this over for a minute. You can save many, many dollars every year by switching to Avalon's, the quality cigarette that costs three to five cents less than other popular price brands. Yes, that repeated and consistent saving of three to five cents on every pack of cigarettes you smoke turns into real money in a surprisingly short time. Now, friends, you have everything to gain in Avalon's. For in addition to this big saving, you still get a superior quality cigarette. Avalon's are 100% union made from an unsurpassed blend of the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos. You'd never guess they cost you less. Supreme quality, outstanding economy, Avalon's are certainly worth the trial. Why not get a pack tonight? the boys playing Alice Holiday. Boy, what a band. They played Three Little Fishies so realistic that two college boys came in wearing napkins. <laughs> what a band. What a band. Well, I'm glad you like the band, Skinny. Yeah. What do you mean, Skinny? Why, your face is so thin it's only got one side to it. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going? Oh, while I was playing, I just happened to remember something. Wasn't the tune by any chance, was it? <laughs> no, I haven't had my five minutes off for a smoke. Oh. Well, I'll be seeing you later, Skinny. Yeah. Skinny. That guy may be a maestro to some people, but he's a rat stro to me. <laughs> Take Dell. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to start a vacation uh, service bureau, so you follow Bob Strong and tell me what he smokes, please. Oh, I don't want to be an informer, Red. Well, then get off that stool, pigeon. <laughs> Go shadow him, will you? Well, now listen. Suppose he doesn't smoke Avalon. Yeah, he wouldn't dare. <laughs> Go on now. Get going. Get okay, going. skinny pants. Yeah. Why does everybody call me skinny? I ain't so thin. Then how come I can see daylight through your ears? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Miss Stillwell. Say, I'm, let's get down to business. I'm starting a skeleton vacation and travel bureau. And if anybody calls up, it's for me. Why don't you get an office? Ah, uh, my office is in my hat. Oh, in a vacant law. Yeah. <laughs> Say, you look nice tonight. You know, I like you. Yes, but would you like me if I were old and ugly? Well, don't I? I mean, uh... <laughs> uh, uh telephone, you better take that. Hello, this is Scout and Vacation Service. We cooked your tours. <laughs> yes. Just a moment, please. 
A lady wants to know if you can arrange an overnight airplane trip to California. Nah, tell her no. This is no fly-by-night concern. <laughs> Hang up one over there, will you? Kind of the... oh. Hiya there, Skelton. Hiya, red boy. Say, uh, how you feeling? Oh, feeling full of pep and ready to go. Uh, on a vacation. I can fix that for you, boy. I've started a vacation service here, and I'll send you on a vacation that'll fill you so full of vitality, you'll be all worn out from carrying her around. <laughs> How would you like to go to Rappaport's by the sea? Oh, I don't think I'd like to. Oh, it's a nice place. Rate's very reasonable. Five dollars a day. Huh? Buck and a half, you argue. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Oh, I, I kind of got a hankering to see the Great Divide. Okay, Miss Stillwell, see what time the next boat leaves for the Great Divide. <laughs> you dope, the Great Divide is in the United States, between the Pacific Coast and the Great Plains. Oh, it is? I thought the Great Divide was in Europe, between two dictators. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who's there? Why don't I find a bill of sailor? <laughs> Thank you, ladies. <laughs> hey, I have a lot of fun here in Chicago, Hanky. Have you met anybody you know? Oh, goodness, no. I haven't met anybody that even looks like anybody I know. <laughs> How are you, Miss Stillwell, after those sandwiches we had last night? Yeah. What sandwiches? Oh, we, we drove out in the country to get some of those Sally Rand sandwiches. Sally Rand? Oh, you know, chicken with very little dressing. <laughs> Say, Herky, how about me helping you decide where to spend your vacation? Oh, no, 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 Mr. Skelton. I always go to Lake Quitchabellyaken. <laughs> and if you like wildlife, you want to go there. It made a regular caveman out of me. <laughs> you look kind of anemic to me. Well, you see, I didn't come out of the cave very often. <laughs> but I certainly had a lot of fun up there pitching horseshoes, although it is kind of strenuous. Yes, yeah, strenuous? Pitching those little shoes? Little shoes? Oh, you mean you're supposed to remove the horses? <laughs> well, I've got to go now. I left some beans on the stove, and if I don't hurry, they might burn my beans. So. Uh, <laughs> Good old Herky, the pink cyclone. <laughs> uh, say, Skelton, you know you wanted me to, uh, to find out if Bob Strong smoked Avalon. Yeah, well, you Mr. Out? Avalon was in the hall, and you know what Bob did to impress him? No, what? He lit a whole pack of Avalons and smoked them all at once. <laughs> Why, that show off. Anything to hold a job. Oh, here he comes now. Look, look at that guy strut. Come on over, Bob. Yeah, come on over, Bob. <laughs> Old Shakespeare Strong. What do you mean, Shakespeare Strong? Oh, he's making a play for somebody. <laughs> Say, have you decided where you're going to spend your vacation? I may not get one. You may get one sooner than you think. <laughs> or maybe I better put it this way, then. Where are you going to spend your layoff? <laughs> are you mad at me, Bob? You didn't say hello. No, I'm not mad. How about a little kiss, Jitterbugsy? Jitterbugs. You're going to start that kissing stuff again this week. You're going to wear out your kisser, you don't watch out. <laughs> oh, corny Casanova. <laughs> you going to let that guy kiss you? Well, who said I was? What do you think would happen if I let every man I meet kiss me? I don't know. What usually happens? <laughs> well, of course now, if you won't let me kiss you, I can't. That's all. Well, how do you know? You haven't even tried yet. So oh, you going to let that guy kiss you? Uh, look, uh, Bob, now, about the vacation. Uh, now, I can let you have an A tour for $10, or for 5 bucks. I can let you have a B tour, or you can take the C tour for two fifty. Well, look here. Here's 50 cents. You take a D tour. Yeah. <laughs> I'll fix you. Jeanette's going to go to town with Don't Worry About Me from the Cotton Club Review, and you'll have to accompany her. Get start traveling, brother. Start traveling. Don't be a fool 
Darling, why should you cling to some fading thing that used to be? If you can forget, don't worry about me. A few serious words about Avalon. Now, in a merry, in a itty bitty poo. Say, Skelton, it's the commercial. I have to say here that Avalon. With we widow feedy and a mummy feedy poo. <laughs> hey, Red, cut it out, cut it out. What'll Mister Avalon say? Fim said a mummy feed Fim if you tin. Listen, Skelton, this is no time for Uta Dead Funny. Oh. <laughs> Don't he fam many fam all over the damn Isn't Isn't wet I gotta do a commercial <laughs> Go ahead and do it some more <laughs> But who is deading me all oh, I can't weed sway <laughs> Listen from hearing that song too much on the radio lately I can't seem to think straight either <laughs> Down in the meadow in a itty bitty field Cut it out wet now cut it out Now listen when, when who buy Avalon, <laughs> who that the choices, Turkish and domestic tobaccos that have been blended together with where kill? <laughs> oh, I can't go on. Oh, I go on, Gail, go on. Yet they give you an equic mild, delightfully mild mold. Who didn't? <laughs> Red, who didn't put in foily enjoyable? <laughs> Why didn't go ahead and tell him about it yourself then? Down in the meadow in a eat a bitty food. Stop it, Red. Stop it. It would stop me in an awful pot, a spot. <laughs> Don't get this story, Del. Did they remember, friends? Avalon caught you three to five cents at another popular price brand. Ooten dooten 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 do. Friends, who'd never death but Avalon's tossed to wet. <laughs> So remember the next time who asks for cigarettes, say... They fim and they fim all over the tin. No, no, no. Ask for ever one cigarette. And don't forget your chain. Uh, 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 take it, Wed Foley, and sing what you're gonna sing. <laughs> oh, sit still. It's all that baby talk. Folks of the Avalon course, I'm gonna sing, uh, Tilva on the Tage. <laughs> Go ahead and play it, Bob Prong, will you? There's silver on the sage tonight Sprinkled by the moon above so lie down, doggies, and let me dream of the one girl I love. There's silver on the sage tonight. We've been on the trail all day. So lie down, doggies, and you dream. Of the range for a word Of the range waiting for you Where the streams never go dry And the grass sparkles with new drops In the meadow of the sweet by and by there's silver on the sea tonight, sprinkled by 
And now for one of our Gaga sagas. This week it's about the purchase, purchase of Manhattan. That's the island where New York City now stands. I'll take the part of Chief Skelton, the guy who sold it to Peter Minuet. Um, you set the scene, will you, Del, while I get my feathers on? Okay, Red. Okay, Bob. The time is May 13, 1626. Peter Minuet, the first governor of New Amsterdam, is about to perform his first official act, the purchase of the island of Manhattan. As the scene opens, we find him and his secretary approaching the Indian village. Well, I hope the Indians will be friendly. Oh, they'll be friendly. Don't look so scared. Who's scared? Well, you are, or else you're overacting the part of a pale face. (laughs) Sissy. But why should I worry? The last time I was here, the big chief liked me so much, he took out an option on my scalp. (laughs) And this time, he might lift the option. Quiet, we're coming into the village. Oh, here's the chief now. Hiya, Chiefy. Hiya, Chiefy. Well, why don't you answer me? That's a totem pole, you dope. <laughs> hmm. Uh, well, uh, don't let it get around that a Dutchman was scared by a pole. <laughs> Shh. Here's a real Indian. Oh. Hiya, Redskin. I want to see the big chief. You want to see Big Chief Walking Bear? Certainly not. Trying to put some clothes on. Ugh. Uh, Ugh uh, what? Okay. <laughs> Enter TP. Management not responsible for toupee. You know, I, I, I don't think we should go in there. It's all right, Peter. Come on in. Oh, there he is. Hiya, TP old boy. Old boy? Old boy? How? How? And how? <laughs> Why you bring squaw? I write shorthand. Yeah? Me must ch- chop off me squaw's hands. She write without hand, too. Uh, <laughs> oh, without that, oh, didn't I? Oh, oh, oh. Who's that? Uh, him only man sick and try. Well, who is he? Him medicine man. <laughs> Look, Chief, we've come to buy Manhattan Island. Yeah? Medicine man make all decisions. Me ask him if we should sell island. Uh, uga waga, aga waga, uga. uga. Ata me a huga, haga to a whole tide, whole tide. Who do you ask? Who do you ask a Uh, ug, ug. Uh. Uh, him say no. What's next question for house? Who buy him next drink? Yeah. <laughs> Must warn delegate from Tammany tribe. Keep quiet. <laughs> Queer people, these foreigners. Yeah. You keep quiet, too. We burn Peter, Peter Minuet at stake. We make Minuet steak. <laughs> I think I look on Nick's face, see if more laughs. <laughs> Indian plant corn, Indian eat corn. Indian, Indian talk corn. Yeah. <laughs> Big Chief no like squall, steal punchline. <laughs> she whiz. Look, Chief, I want to buy Manhattan Island. I have lots of money. What good money to Indian? To buy food. Indian shoot food. Buy clothes. Indian shoot clothes. Have fun. Indian shoot pale face. <laughs> pale face crazy. Every time he sat down to eat, tried to stab face with stick. <laughs> That's a fork, you dope. White squall like British Empire. Sun never set on tongue. <laughs> Tawaga, wooga, hooga. Tawaga. Look. The medicine man's talking with his eyes closed. Yeah, him in solo conference. Ooga, ta, hika, googa, wooga. 
But yeah. fast. Are oh, you kidding? <laughs> Very strange. Medicine man have dreams. Says, sell Manhattan Island quick. You still want to buy? Quick, right away? Huh? Yes. But all I have with me is a bunch of junk. No money. Well, empty pockets will do. Okay. Here's some beads and trinkets and marbles and stuff. Altogether, it's probably worth some $24. Some imagination. Yeah. <laughs> me take junk, you take island. Okay, wrap it up. And you sign right here. Me no can write. That's all right. He can't read. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chiefy. Mm. Me think Chief holds short end of stick. <laughs> hey, wake up, medicine man. Me kick your head uh, in. Ugo, Ugo. <laughs> Ooga, 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 ooga. Yeah, medic man speak, me translate. Oh, ooga, wah, ooga, mug. Oh, wug, wug, a guy, mooga, who, go, go, who. Mmm. <laughs> Medicine man say, have dream of Manhattan Island. Many moons from now. He see 1939. He see trouble for Indians if we stay here. Headlights and paper. He see Yankees, more Indian. <laughs> he also see Dewey. Make it hot for Tammany tribe. A <laughs> wugga, mahuga, mahuga. Oh, no. Also, dice committee after red. <laughs> okay, play please. Big Chief Happy sell Manhattan. You take Island, me take ferry boat, Hoboken, two minutes. So long. Yoo-hoo! <laughs> Highest quality, but cost three to five cents less than other popular price brands. And when you can get supreme quality in Avalon for less, why pay more? So the next time, ask for Avalon. And don't forget your change. Yes, Avalon cigarettes, dear friends, cost several cents less than others. You too can say this difference like all of us Avalon brothers. Each pack is wrapped in cello blade, each pack is union made. No wonder folks from coast to coast say Avalon's lead the parade. So why not always travel along with Avalon? Yes, you'd never guess, but Avalon's cost only ten cents, plus city or state tax. Ladies and gentlemen, Avalon time is made possible through your loyalty to Avalon cigarettes. And we'd like to thank you for keeping Avalon on the air. And we hope that you'll tune us in again next week. Good night and greetings to all the mothers. The Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation presents Avalon Time each Saturday at the same time. Del King speaking. So long, everybody. (laughs) Avalon Time has come to you from our Chicago studios. This is the National Broadcasting Company. W-E-A-F, New York, 9 p.m., B-U-L-O-V-A, Bull of the Watch Time. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is tree, T-R-E-E. Really? You bet your life! The DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, a comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is, the one, the only... That's logical. This is National Pickle Week. Oh, that's me, Groucho Marx. Thank you. Well, here I am again with $1,000 for one of our couples, George Fenneman. Who's first to try for it? Just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected the mother of a large family and an expectant father. And here they are, Mrs. Lois Mayer 
And Mr. Charles Weiss, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, folks, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. And if you say the secret word, you'll divide $100 in cash. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mrs. Uh, Ma, Lois Ma, you're the mother of a large family? Yes, I am. Pretty young-looking gal, aren't you? <laughs> how, how large is your family? I have eight children. You have eight children? Eight children. children. Well, you certainly don't look at it. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Weiss, you're the expectant father? Yes, sir. You don't look at either. Huh? <laughs> you, do you have any other children, Mr. Weiss? Uh, no, sir, this is my first. Oh, your first, eh? <laughs> well, you better rest a while. The first one is the hardest. <laughs> where, where are you from, Mr. Weiss? I was born in New Haven, Connecticut, raised in Newport, Rhode Island, moved to New York, and then came out here about a year and a half ago. Who was after you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mrs. Ma, what does your husband do for a living, uh, Mrs. Ma? Well, we just started catering not so long ago. To each other? <laughs> well, where are you from, little mother? I'm from Leona Mines, Virginia. And oh. I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, after I was married. And then we came to California. Is that the customary route? Huh? <laughs> now, tell us something about this catering you mentioned. What sort of a business is it, specifically? Well, uh, we put on dinners for parties. Any particular kind of food or just... Whatever uh... you choose. I see. Well, I choose the food after I eat it, but... Uh... <laughs> What, what, what do you charge for a dinner like that? It's according to what you're going to eat. You're pretty cagey, aren't you, huh? <laughs> well, uh, approximately, uh, Lois. Oh, anywhere from a dollar and a half to two and a half plate. And uh, suppose you put something on the plate. How much extra? <laughs> I'll just call you Charlie, huh? Not you, Mrs. Moore. I mean you, uh... What sort of work do you do, Charlie? I'm a sales representative for Admiral... for America's number one television set, Admiral. <laughs> Did you just make that up? Uh... Did you get me one wholesale? <laughs> Come around. <laughs> Does anybody ever buy anything retail anymore? Huh? <laughs> How old are your children, uh, Lois? Oh, I have them all ages. <laughs> the government around 79? <laughs> what do you mean, all ages? No, what? Oh, uh, 15, 13, 12, 9, 7, 6, 4, and 8 months. You just got under the wire there with that. Man. <laughs> With a family your size, Lois, uh, how large a hotel do you run? We have four bedrooms. How do you get them all out in the morning, I mean? You put them on a conveyor belt? Or... <laughs> well, hardly like that. I, well, I have five boys and three girls. And I well, wake the oldest girl up first, and the baby wakes up instead of the oldest girl. And I go around yelling, quarter of seven, quarter of seven. <laughs> Suppose it's eight o'clock. Do you still yell at quarter of seven? How do you discipline the youngsters? Oh, they're pretty well behaved most of the time. You never when... take a swipe at them? <laughs> Only in self-defense. <laughs> Did you have trouble finding names for all these kiddies? No, we have a book at home. <laughs> Well, uh, Lois, my advice to you is it isn't too late. Throw the book away. Huh? <laughs> How about you, uh, Mr. Weiss? Have you got a definite name for your youngster? Yes, we have. You are? What are you going to name it, huh? Uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> Sounds pretty definite, huh? <laughs> Sounds like an Indian name, huh? <laughs> what is the kid's name? We don't know yet, Jones. Huh? <laughs> what do you mean you have a definite name, but you don't know yet? Well, Why? we don't know what it'll Charlie be. Charlie Weiss, what kind of talk is that, huh? <laughs> we don't know what it'll be yet. <laughs> you mean there's a likelihood that it may have wings and fly out the window? <laughs> 
<laughs> Which would you prefer, uh, Charlie, a boy or a girl? Well, it doesn't make much difference to us as long as it's a baby. <laughs> Why do you want a baby? <laughs> well, what an odd thing to wish for. Huh? <laughs> well, after we're through here, talk to Mrs. Uh, Moore about it. Maybe she can get it for you wholesale. <laughs> Well, it's been very instructive talking to you two, and I hope you'll both be very happy. Now, in just one minute, you're going to play your bet your life for $1,000. To millions of car owners across this nation, the sign of a DeSoto Plymouth dealer stands for two things. The best in new car values, the best in service. Next time you're at a DeSoto Plymouth dealer's for service, make it a point to find out about the two truly great new cars he sells. One is the brilliant new DeSoto, the car that's really new inside and out, bringing you more beauty, economy, and comfort. The moment you see the new DeSoto, you'll note its clean, modern design, the graceful new lines that sweep back from its magnificent new full-width front grille to its smart, roomy trunk. It's a thrilling car, this all-new DeSoto. The car that lets you drive without shifting. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell the beautiful new Plymouth, the car that likes to be compared. Now let's see if you two will be high for the night and get the chance at the $1,000. Fanneman, explain the rules. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want on each of four questions. The couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the DeSoto Plymouth $1,000 question at the end of the show. Our other two couples are in a waiting room off stage, so they don't know what's happening out here. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected mountain peaks of the world as your category. Is that right? That's right. Well, here's your first question. You have $20. How much will you risk? $10. All right. Where is uh, Mauna Loa found? M-A-U-N-A, capital L-O-A. In the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands is right. Off to the lift start, Groucho. We have thirty dollars. All right. Remember, you're going for a thousand dollars tonight. Now, how much of the thirty will you try? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. In what country is Popa Catapetal found? In Mexico. Mexico is correct. <laughs> They're climbing. They have fifty-five dollars. You got fifty-five dollars, and here's your third question. How much of the fifty-five do you want to try? Fifty. Where is Mount Everest found? Oh, Everest in Tibet. They're really climbing now. They have $105. 105. You gonna, 105. You're going to shoot the whole we'll thing. Shoot the work. All right, here's your last chance to beat the other couple. Where is Mount Vesuvius? Uh, Mount Vesuvius is in Italy. All right. And they wind up with a grand total of $210. <laughs> Good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. Groucho. Yes. The secret word is still tree. Perhaps the next couple will say it. They might. Just before we went on the air, we selected a housewife from the audience. A good idea. <laughs> Her name is Mrs. Mary Ann Hughes. A splendid notion. And a hypnotist, Mr. Fred Schneider. And here they are. Folks, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome to your bet your life. And if you say the DeSoto Plymouth secret word, you'll divide $100 between you. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mr. Schneider, you're the hypnotist? Yes, I am. Well, don't look me in the eye when you answer me. <laughs> Somebody has to stay awake around here. <laughs> now, Mrs. Uh, Hughes, uh, Marion Hughes, huh? Marion Hughes and Repentant Leisure, isn't that the... Uh, that the... <laughs> no, I guess not. Uh, you're, uh, you're the housewife? Yes, I am. Well, you're a very attractive housewife. Huh? Thank you. What does your husband do, Mrs. Hughes? Well, he works for food craft. Food craft? Mm-hmm. He sells pickles. <laughs> How did, how did you meet him? Was he pickled at the time? No, he, was, he, he wasn't old enough to be pickled when I met him. How old do you have to be to be pickled? <laughs> well, how, how, how did you meet him? Huh? Well, I met him in a blacksmith shop in Illinois. He was uh, molding a brand for his pony, and he had heated the iron, and he had formed the letters M-A-X, and he put them in this big tub of water. Max? Because they were hot. Uh -huh. Was that the pony's name or your husband's No, that was his name. He was oh. going to brand his pony, Max. What was the pony's name? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Didn't the pony have a name? 
Well, I didn't ask him. I don't know. Don't you think it was rather unfair to the poor pony to... I, I'm sorry. I should have asked the pony. <laughs> Well, there you are with the pony and Max and the... I hadn't noticed my my husband very much. I mean, he put the brand in the tub of water, and a devil's horse came flying by, and what's I... That, what's that? A devil's horse? A devil's horse? Uh-huh. Was well, there... he getting shoed, too, in the black... <laughs> what's a devil's horse? Well, those those huge varmints they have back east. They fly through the air, and they look like a little horse, only they're an insect. And if they bite you, it's just your death. They say... Who, who are they? I mean, I've always wanted to track that down, they say. Well, that's, that's what I've heard all my life. And oh. I saw this coming at me, and I didn't like it. Well, I got excited, and I fell over in this tub of water on the top of this brand. And, uh, I got branded. <laughs> Isn't it a little embarrassing to walk around the bathing beach with Max stamped on you? <laughs> no, it really isn't noticeable at all. So I, I still don't see how this culminated in marriage. The mere fact that you were named Max at the time. As a matter of fact, all three of you were named Max by this time. <laughs> but what about you, I strain? I... I... <laughs> What kind of a brand do you carry? Are you, uh, are you married? Yes, I'm married. Some hypnotist. She caught you napping, eh? <laughs> Tell me, Svengali, what are some of the uses? <laughs> what are some of the uses for hypnotism? Well, it's being used a great deal medically today, especially through this last war. Mm -hmm. uh, such things as uh, overcoming and removing phobias, bad habits. Could you hypnotize me and cure me of my insomnia? Mm, yes. Huh? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I doubt it. I don't have insomnia. <laughs> I just can't sleep at night, that's all. <laughs> Could you hypnotize me and cure me of uh, smoking cigars? Well, any ordinary person you could hypnotize. <laughs> Answer my question. Can you hypnotize me? Well, I don't know. I have to try it first. Well, flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> I guess I'm safe in ordering another box of cigars. <laughs> Can you show me how to hypnotize somebody? Try it on Mrs. Hughes here. Huh? Sure, I'd be glad Mrs. to. Mrs. Hughes, do you mind if he hypnotizes you? Oh, I don't think I'd like that. <laughs> oh, you don't want to give up smoking cigars either. <laughs> Well, how do you hypnotize somebody? What's the first step? Well, the first step is to get their attention, have them concentrate on your voice, and then have them think of figures or numbers. As you count, for instance, to five, they'll go deep asleep. Then you begin counting one, tell them to relax and grow heavy, their legs and their arms. <laughs> Two, they're growing very... Are you trying to give me the double whammy here? <laughs> Well, I wasn't trying very hard. <laughs> Can you hypnotize a whole audience? Uh, a large portion of a whole audience. I did a, a demonstration at the Long Beach Municipal Auditorium several years ago. There were about 3,500 people there, and several hundred actually went to sleep. <laughs> occur to you that perhaps the show was lousy? <laughs> well, now that everybody's in a trance, let's play you bet your life for a thousand dollars. You run your twenty dollars into more than the other couples and you get the big chance. I can't tell you how much our first couple won, but Fenneman's offstage remind our listeners. The expectant father and the mother of eight children won $210. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your $20. You selected American Patriots as your category. Is that right? Now, here's your first question. How much are the 20? 
What was the name of the American statesman who said, give me liberty or give me death? Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry is right. <laughs> They're on their way with $30. Remember, you're going for $1,000 tonight. Uh, how much of the 30 will you try? 25 Twenty-five. What was the name of the soldier and statesman who avenged the Alamo at San Jacinto? Was it Sam Houston? Sam Houston is correct. They're on the way now. They have fifty-five dollars. And here's your third question. And how much of the fifty-five? Fifty. What was the name of the patriot in charge of the Boston Tea Party? He also signed the Declaration of Independence. Sam Adams. Samuel Adams is correct. <laughs> now they have one hundred five dollars. This gal has read a number of books. Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 105? 100. 100. What was the name of the woman who supposedly said, Shoot if you must, this old gray head, but spare your country's flag? Jane. Jane. Um, wasn't Bessie? No. I, I'm terribly sorry. It was Barbara Fritchie. Well, that's tough luck. You bet all your money you wound up broke. I'm going to give you another chance to make some money. Get this one right, and you win $10 in cash. Now, think hard. Who is buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> General Grant is right. <laughs> Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers, and I will soon know get the chance at the $1,000 question. Mr. Car Owner, what have you done about the warmer weather that lies ahead? I'm sending my long underwear to storage. But what about your car? Is it all set for the miles of pleasant motoring? Can you count on it for smooth operation on vacation and during those summer weekends? Better visit a DeSoto Plymouth dealer real soon. Let his service experts tune up your car. Bring in your violin, too. You see, friends, a car that's been checked by DeSoto Plymouth mechanics will zoom along the road and purr like a cat. May even drink milk. So take the man's advice, folks. Bring your car, your violin, and your cat in wherever you see the sign of a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. All right, Fenneman, who's ahead in the battle for the $1,000 question? Well, the mother of eight children and the expectant father are ahead with $210. And the secret word is still tree. We invited some boxers and some ballet dancers to the program tonight. And just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Miss Patty Taylor and Mr. Art Aragon. And here they are, folks. Meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, youngsters, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. And if you say the secret word, you'll divide $100 between you. It's a common word, something you see every day. A boxer and a ballet dancer, eh? Um, which are you? Uh... <laughs> I'm the boxer. You're, you're the boxer? Huh? Uh, wh what is your name? Art Ar Ar Aragon, eh? Where are you from, Art? I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh. Before we proceed, let me caution you. Uh, on this program, you're liable to hear bells occasionally, Art. Uh... Don't come out swinging if you do. <laughs> what is your fighting weight, uh, Art? Uh, 135 stripped. Did you say strapped or stripped? Uh, <laughs> now, how much do you weigh with your clothes on? I don't know. I never weigh with my clothes on. You must draw a nice crowd when you get weigh at the end. <laughs> Are you married or haven't you lost a fight yet? Uh? Oh, uh, I'm married, but we don't fight at home. You don't, huh? In the morning, does your wife have to count to nine before you'll get up? Huh? <laughs> what about you, Twinkle Toes? Let's find out something about you. You're, you're a ballet dancer, huh? Yes. Where are you from? Uh, what is your name? Fifi? Uh, Patty, huh? <laughs> Patty Taylor. Are, are you married? No, I'm not married. You're not married, huh? For a ballet dancer, apparently you're not on your toes. Huh? <laughs> Let's see you get up on your toes. Huh? In these shoes? Yeah. You need toes for that. How oh, you have toes, eh? About ten. Did you say you were about ten? No, eighteen now. Well, you just said ten. Ten toes. Oh, ten toes, but you're eighteen. Yes. Yeah. Could be worse, you know. You could be ten and have eighteen toes. <laughs> I knew a guy like that once. <laughs> he was really two girls, but I don't want to. <laughs> now, one punch. How do you train for a big fight? Well, uh, let's see. I get up at 6.30 in the morning, I go run, I come back and I go to bed. <laughs> Wouldn't it be simpler to just stay there in the first place? 
<laughs> Once you're up, why don't you stay up? Well, uh, that's not all of the training. I've got a little bit more. There is? What else? Well, I get up at 10 o'clock and I eat my breakfast. Then I go back to bed. <laughs> you, uh, you must have a fortune tied up in pajamas. <laughs> then what do you do? Well, I go train the gym for a couple of hours, then I go home and go to bed. <laughs> Then I get up at about uh, 5 o'clock and I eat my dinner, go out and take a walk, and I come home and go to bed. You don't, you don't see much of the outside world, do you? <laughs> Why do you do all that work? Why is there so much uh, sleeping and jumping up and down? Well, how do you want to get in top shape? Top shape? Well, who wants to be shaped like a top? <laughs> now, what are the first things you have to learn about ballet, Patty? Um, well, the first thing would be the five basic uh, dance positions. And what are the five basic dance positions? One, two, three, four, and five. <laughs> well, you, you ask a ridiculous question, you get a ridiculous question. On the other hand, Aragon only has two positions. <laughs> Vertical and horizontal. <laughs> uh, could you describe the first dance position, Patty? Well, position number one, you have your feet together, your heels together, and your toes pointed outwards and push your heels forward. Well, that sounds pretty simple. So, <laughs> so what are some of the basic steps of the ballet? Oh, there's tour jetés, pirouettes, glissades, assemblées, jetés, and entrechacatres. What time do you stop at Nacogdoche? <laughs> Isn't all that stuff Greek to you, uh, Art? It's French. It's French. <laughs> well, all I can say is vive la France. <laughs> what qualifications are necessary to become a good uh, ballet dancer? Oh, most of the qualifications are physical. You should have a sturdy body and flexible and a slender figure. And uh, it's good to have long legs, but it isn't necessary. Well, uh... <laughs> the legs should certainly be long enough to reach the floor, Patty. <laughs> well, it's been very interesting talking to you two. Now, let's see how agile you are in the quiz. Now, you beat the other two couples, and you'll get a chance at the $1,000 DeSoto Plymouth question. I can't tell you how much the other two couples won, but Fenneman's off stage to remind our listeners. The mother of eight children and the expectant father are ahead with $210. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You select the sporting terms as your category. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Now, how much you want to bet of the $20? Okay. Talk right out loud in the microphone. Like the fight was over and you were saying, hello, Mom. <laughs> A Texas leaguer uh, is an expression in what sport? Baseball. Baseball is correct. <laughs> On the way, Groucho, it's thirty dollars. Well, you hit that over the fence. Remember, you're going for a thousand dollars tonight. Now, how much of the thirty will you try? Twenty-five. Twenty-five, she said. Twenty-five. A lob shot is an expression of what sport? L O B. Oh, wait just a moment. A lob. It's a uh, uh, tennis. That's right. Tennis. Twenty dollars. Fifty-five dollars. You got fifty-five dollars, and here's your third question. How much will you bet? Forty. Uh, Riposte, I guess, R-I-P-O-S-T-E, is a maneuver in what sport? How do you spell it? R-I-P-O-S-T-E. You guess. Riposte. Football? No. No, uh, uh, that's a tough question. It's fencing. It's a... They now have $15. That's a shame. All right, here's your last chance to beat the other couple. How much for 15 will you try? All of it. All of it. A stymie is an expression of what sport? That's on TV, huh? I'm stymied. No, oh, not Marvel. I'm stymied. You stymied a guy. Gee, that's simple. Stymied. Stymied mo- thought it was marbles. Or- well, I was thinking of golf, but I guess they have stymies and marbles. But I'd say you're right. They wind up with $30.
Matt Haynes, the expectant father and the mother of eight children with $210, get the chance at the DeSoto Plymouth $1,000 question. To serve you efficiently, to serve you promptly. Those are the aims of every DeSoto Plymouth dealer. No matter what make of car you drive, no matter what sort of attention it needs, a DeSoto Plymouth dealer is well equipped to give your car the very best in service. Skilled, factory-trained mechanics, the most modern tools and equipment made, service at a fair price, and prompt, courteous treatment every time. That's the kind of service you get. When you drive in at the sign of a DeSoto Plymouth dealer, that's the kind of service that means extra miles for your car. From coast to coast, there are more than 3,000 of these DeSoto Plymouth dealers, each with an earnest desire to serve you. And here is the mother of eight and the expectant father, the winning couple... All ready for the DeSoto Plymouth $1,000 question, Groucho. Here we go for $1,000. Ready? I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you, so think carefully and please no help from the audience. Here it is. The Panama Canal, one of the great engineering feats of all time, would never have been possible if it weren't for the discovery of the Isthmus of Panama. For $1,000, tell me who discovered the Isthmus of Panama. What is the answer you two have decided upon? Uh, Balboa. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but it was Christopher Columbus on his last voyage to the New World. Well, that's the correct answer, so that means the big question next week will be worth $1,500. Well, you lost the big money, but you won $210 in the quiz. Congratulations and thanks to both of you. You Bet Your Life is a John Goodell production. Transcribed from Hollywood, directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, You Bet Your Life. Presented by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And don't forget... Next week, the big question will be worth $1,500. So good night, folks. And remember, just be sure to see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. <laughs> folks, here's a tip from the National Safety Council. May is National Car Safety Month. So remember, check your car, check accidents. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. Amazing! It's Prell, P R E L L, Procter and Gamble's new Radiant Cream Shampoo in the handy tube. Prell brings you the life of Riley. Prell, the shampoo that removes unsightly dandruff in as little as three minutes and leaves hair radiantly clean, radiantly lovely, presents. The Life of Riley, with William Bendix as Riley. <laughs> For several years now, Chester A. Riley has lived in a small suburb of Los Angeles. And Riley, being the man he is, has left his mark upon the neighborhood. So tonight, as he returns home from a hard day's work, his passage down the street does not go unnoticed. Take, for instance, the Werner's Cocker Spaniel. 
Ah, just look at that cute little puck there, panting happily, his tail wagging gaily. And then he sees Riley. But Riley walks slightly up. And as he crosses the street, the policeman on the corner shouts a greeting. Hey, you, you blind or something, I'll give you a ticket for jaywalking. But Riley walked on unperturbed. Halfway down the block, he passes Joe's fruit stand. Hey, you, put back that grape. But Riley ignores these rebuffs from a cruel material world. For now, he's almost home, where he can always count on his loving wife and children to shower him with the tenderness, admiration, and respect that is his due as master of the house. Oh, hi, everybody. Hello, Daddy. Hiya, Pop. Well, come home at last. Goodbye, Daddy. Bye, Pop. Hey, wait. Come back in here, you two. Well, what's wrong? We're in a hurry. Never mind. Come in here. Got a way to greet me when I come home after a hard day's work? Hello, goodbye. You're the rudest kids I ever saw. But, Daddy... Don't try to deny it. You don't know the first thing about common courtesy. Yeah, but... Don't Daddy... try to deny it. After all, I'm your father. But, Daddy... Don't try to deny it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry, Pop. Fine pair of kids you turned out to be. Hello, goodbye. Why, when you were babies and all you could say was burp, we had longer conversations. <laughs> Gee, we said we're sorry, Pop. I get more attention from that cocker spaniel down the street. At least he tries to bite me. <laughs> but you, you, you just ignore me. Me, the guy who's always thinking of you. Look, here's a grape I brought home for you. <laughs> we were in a hurry, Daddy. Where are you going? It's supper time. Oh, we ate early. Yeah, we're going to the movies. We're going to see Gentleman's Agreement. Uh, fine kids I got. You'd rather pay good dough to sit in a theater and watch a gentleman than stay home and look at me. <laughs> Don't cost you nothing. We'll be back early, Daddy, dear. We've got to go now, Junior. Oh, yeah, it's late. You're staying home tonight. Oh, but, Pa, I... Oh, Riley. What's the trouble, dear? Now, this don't concern you, Peg. Hello, Peg. Now, take your coat off. <laughs> but, Daddy, I made a date to meet Joni at the theater. And I meet Neghead Gillis. I don't care how many dates you made. But, Riley... Please, Peg. My head's made up. <laughs> you kids can't go to the movies unless you first get permission from the head of this house. Well, we did. Uh-huh. You see, Peg, how they make up stuff. I, I never said they could go. Dear, I said they could. <laughs> well, have a good time at the movies, kid. <laughs> Hello there, Ronnie. Oh, it's you, Gillis. What are you so grouchy about? Oh, so the kids of mine. I caught them sneaking off to the movies without permission. Boy, I pulled them off good. You know what I said? How should I know? I ain't the kind of a sloopy guy who goes around eavesdropping on his next-door neighbor. Well, I told them plenty. You were right. Why should they pay dough to watch a gentleman when they can stay home and look at you? <laughs> Gillis, you heard. Well, we got free speech in this country, so I help myself. <laughs> hey, what are you writing there? Suggestion. You, you know, for that contest here at the plant. Well, you don't think you're going to cut one of them prizes? Well, why not? Believe me, I got some great ideas. Oh, your wife's been helping you. <laughs> Just what do you mean by that, Gillis? Well, you got a brain like this, Riley. It, um... Well, let me put it another way. <laughs> An empty bucket can't hold water unless somebody fills it. Oh, yeah, well, my brain holds plenty of water. <laughs> I do my own thinking. I'm the boss in my house. Yeah, some boss. Like when the kids wanted to go to the movies. I just didn't want to make no trouble. No wonder your kids don't respect you. Hello, goodbye. You think so, Gillis? You think that's it? What else? They want something, they go to pay. She makes the decision. Pretty soon they start ignoring you. Next thing you know, you're a stranger in the house. And one fine morning, you kiss Peg goodbye, your junior turns to your babs and says, Who's the big jerk kissing mama? <laughs> You're right, Gillis. Peg's been running things long enough. From now on, I'm making all the decisions. Now you are talking. Peg ain't gonna push me around. Yo, what are you, a man or a mouse? All these years I've been a mouse. 
From now on, I'm a rat. Don't bother me now, Ped. Can't you see I'm busy? I got work to do. Oh, okay, I'll ask Mother. Mother, could you let me have 50 cents? Oh, certainly, dear. Hand me my purse over Just there. Just a minute. Ped, any time you want money, you ask me for it, not your mother. But, Riley, I can give it to her. I make the money and I'll dish it out. All right, Daddy, will you dish it out like an angel? I can put my hand in my pants pocket just as easy as your mother can. <laughs> After all, I'm, uh, 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 funny, it must be the other pocket. Uh, well, uh, maybe here in my wallet. Uh, maybe it's, uh, Peg, will you lend me 50 cents? Hand me my purse over there, Dad. Here you are. Hand these two quarters to your father. Here, Daddy. Thanks. Now, uh, what was it you said you wanted? 50 cents. Sorry, I can only let you have a quarter. Daddy. Would you deny your own father car fare tomorrow? Well, I can manage with a quarter. Thanks, Dad. And like I said before, Ed, any time you want money, you get it from me, not your mother. Darling, what's gotten into you? You're not yourself tonight. You bet I'm not, and it's about time there was a change. Things are going to be different from now on. Those kids are going to know I'm alive. I don't understand you at all. Why are you acting like this? I'll tell you why. So that if they ever catch someone kissing you, they'll know that I'm the big jerk that's doing it. Dear, did you get your head caught in the bus door again? <laughs> no, I walked home. Please, Peg, I'm busy. I've got work to do. Well, what are you so busy about, Dad? Never mind, Dad. Your father's got plenty to be busy about. He don't have to wait for your mother to tell me what to do. He does my own thinking. All right, dear, I'm not arguing. Go ahead, think. You know, I'm no dope. I just give that impression. <laughs> You'll see, I'll cop one of those prizes in the contest. What contest? Down at the plant to increase the efficiency. They want suggestions from the workers, and I'm writing up my entry. It's a great idea, you see. Every day... Hey, Mom, when the blue sweater? Junior, don't interrupt. Oh, excuse me. Well, you may as well listen to this, too. I'm going out and play. Never mind playing. Stay here and learn something. Now, here's my suggestion. You see, there's an awful lot of time wasted every day by 2,000 guys who have to stand in line to punch the time clock. So my suggestion is, let the first man who gets there punch all the cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, huh? But, dear, if, if one man punches all the cards, how'll they know when the other men come and go? Mom's right. What are you standing there for? Go out and play. <laughs> and then what happened, right? The fellow was just like you, said Gillis. Peg tried to do my thinking for me, try to force ideas into my head. But she was up against the stone wall. <laughs> and then what happened? Well, I decided I wouldn't enter the contest, just to spite it. Then we had a little argument, but... After all, it's Oh, no way. This is bigger than any individual. It's us men against the opposition sex. And believe me, you're worse off than I thought. This situation has got to be put a stop to. You've got to tell Peg off once and for all. Wait, you, you really think so? Positively. I won't get no rest until you do. <laughs> well, I, I don't like to make a scene. You don't have to handle it like I do with my wife, Honeybee. Well, what do you do? I write her a letter. A letter? Sure, like last week. She kept nagging me for more dough. All day long, talk, talk, talk. But I didn't make no scene. I sat down and wrote her like this. Mrs. Honeybee Gillis. Dear Matt, drop that. <laughs> well, that, that, that's a little rough, Gillis. I know, but I signed it your loving husband. <laughs> well, so long as you were polite about it. And the letter went great. She didn't talk to me for a week. Uh, you take a tip from me. Sit right down and write big a sarcastic letter. Yeah, where's your pen? To... Oh, here. Uh, dear Peg. That's too friendly. Yeah, you're right. I'll make it very businesslike. Dear sir, 
Uh, uh, dear Mrs. Rand. No, no, wait a minute. Let's think of something clever. Uh, she's a very bossy type. Bossy. Riley, I got it. Dear boss. <laughs> that is clever. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> dear boss, I just want to say. Uh, well, what do I want to say? <laughs> say like this. Dear boss, for years I have been working just for you. You have always told me what to do and what to think. And naturally, I love that. <laughs> you got that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> and then I'll say now, uh, something real sarcastic. Yeah. Um, after all, I'm just a nobody. I have no brain. But you're so smart. A regular genius. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> then I'll finish up like this. Yeah. Therefore, I think it's very kind of you to let me hang around all these years. And let me have so much money every week, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really too much. Why don't you just give me half? <laughs> that's right, that's right, right. <laughs> Make her feel cheap. Oh, this is a marvelous ridiculous. Boy, am I glad I learned to write. <laughs> <laughs> Comes in handy. Yeah, now close with um, your devoted slate. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> Your devoted slave, Chester A. Riley. Ah, yeah, now I'll put it in this envelope, and I'll mark it uh, for Peg person. No, 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 no. Uh, Make it um, to the boss. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> to the boss. Personal. Uh, I'll leave it right here on the table so she'll see it first thing tomorrow morning. Well, uh, Riley, you've done it. Yep. I got to hand it to you. <laughs> yes, sir. And you know, Gillis... I got a feeling this letter's going to make a big change in my life. Huh? <laughs> well, the second act of the life of Riley in a moment. Say, Ken, a growing favorite with all the family is Prell, Procter and Gamble's radiant cream shampoo in the handy tube. That's right, and here are two reasons why Prell rates with families everywhere. First, Prell rids hair of dulling soap film. Leaves hair radiantly soft, radiantly smooth, easy to manage. Second, doctor's examinations prove that Prell removes unsightly dandruff in as little as three minutes. And that regular Prell shampoos control such dandruff. And just one trial will prove there's nothing so handy as that Prell tube. No messy jars, no slippery bottles. It's safe for youngsters, too. And Prell goes far. A little makes mountains of lather. Is it any wonder that families everywhere are asking for... P-R-E-L-L, Pell Shampoo. Leaves hair radiant, gleaming bright. Not a bit of dandruff is in sight. Comes in a tube, and it too. P-R-E-L-L, Pell Shampoo. By Prell Shampoo. And now back to the life of Riley with William Bendix and Riley. Stop worrying, Riley, and watch your machine. It's already 8.30 a.m., and you ain't done no work yet. Well, I... I can't work, Gillis. I should never have written Peg that letter. It'll just upset her. I, yeah, I should it. never. Yeah. Did I ever say you wrong? Believe me, when I made you write that letter, it was the best advice I could have given. Well, maybe it works with your wife, but my Peg ain't like other wives. Gillis. All wives are the same. It's like in chemistry. Maybe iodine's got a few more molecules than arsenic, and arsenic's got a few more molecules than cyanide, but they're all poison. <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah but, but Peg is different. She, she's very sensitive. I remember on our honeymoon when I missed the train, she, she got very upset. <laughs> yeah, she was younger in them days, and she was still in love with you then. What do you mean, then? We're in love now. Yeah, but there's love and love. You've been married 17, 18 years. You're a little older. You're getting gray hairs. Well, so what? Just because there's snow on the roof don't mean the fire's going out in the house. <laughs> All right, so you're still in love. Yeah, and that's why that letter was a big mistake. I... Riley, I don't make no mistakes. And when I made you write that letter, I done you the biggest favor of your life. Yeah, but there's no telling what Peg will do when she reads that letter. Why, why she might even leave me. No, she wouldn't do that. No, you don't know Peg. You really think she'd leave you? Yeah. And take the kids with her. 
Riley, when you sent that letter, you made the biggest mistake of your life. <laughs> you got your nerve. Now he tells me I made a mistake. Hey, pass me that oil can. Never mind the oil can. Tell me what to do. Don't ask me. If there's one thing I never do, it's advise a guy how to run his marriage. <laughs> Boy, you... You got me into this in the first place. If it hadn't been for you, I'd... that oil can already. I'll throw it to you, all right? Hey, wait, look out! Oh. Now look what you've done. You hit the dynamo. I bet you short circuited the whole plant. I didn't know what I was doing. It was an accident. You're going to catch it for this. Yeah, I ain't scared. They can't scare me. Hey, here comes the foreman. Turn hey. Hey, Riley, come back here! Well, I better be getting to school, Mom. I still don't understand, Junior. Your father never goes off to work without waking me to say goodbye. Well, he must have been in a big hurry. Oh, I guess he's anxious to get his suggestions in for that contest. Today's the last day, and he... Well, well, what's this? What, Mom? Well, there's letter here on the table. To the boss. Personal. Well, if that isn't just like your father, he forgot to take his suggestion for that contest. Oh. Well, gee, and, and he'll miss the deadline. Junior, dear, on your way to school, go by the plant and see that this letter gets to Mr. Stevenson this morning. Okay. Oh, your father'd be so upset if this didn't get to the boss. You never can tell about business. Why, a thing like this could make a big change in your father's life. <laughs> Trouble. Nothing but trouble. Ever since I was born. Boy, how I wish I had my life to live over. Personally, I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? It is I, Digby O'Dell, the friendly undertaker. <laughs> oh, hello, Digger. I was saying, personally, I'm against wishing. Wishing is a frivolous folly. Yeah. I guess you're right, Digger. Only sometimes I get a feeling the cards are stacked against me. You're not the only one. I was in Las Vegas over the weekend. <laughs> Las Vegas? Where they gamble? Yes. I dropped a bundle there. Well, how much money did you lose? I made money. I dropped a bundle. <laughs> Tell me, Riley, what are you doing gadding about in mid-morning? Shouldn't you be at the plan? Well, it's a long story, Digger. You see, I didn't like the way Peg was always telling me what to do. Huh? And what's wrong with that? My dear wife, Brunhilda, is always telling me what to do. She even helps me in my business. She nails the orders, and I carry them out. <laughs> I know. I, I wasn't fair to Peg. And... Well, then I had this fight with Gillisy, and I threw the oil can at him and short-circuited the dynamo. Shocking. <laughs> I know, but I lost my head. I picked up the first thing that was laying around. Oh, you must practice self-control. Can you imagine what would happen down at my place if I picked up the first thing that was laying around and threw it? <laughs> I could lose a lot of customers that way. And then when I saw the foreman coming, I beat it. You ran off? Yeah. Oh, that was the coward's way. Take my advice. Go back. <laughs> Make a clean breast of it. But I'll get fired. No, I'm going home. Maybe I can figure out some excuse. Riley, I beseech you. I ain't going, Digger. You, you can't make me go someplace I don't want to go. Maybe not now. <laughs> but someday, I'll be in the driver's. <laughs> Cheerio. I'd better be shoveling off. <laughs> Riley, you'll have to face the foreman sooner or later. You should have stayed right there. You want me to get fired? That'd be fine. Oh, take it easy. You're not fired yet. I will be, unless I can think up a good excuse. Help me, Peg. What can I do? You're the only one who can solve this. So, so you won't help me. A fine wife you turned out to be. Oh, I want to help you, dear, but I don't see how I can. It's strictly up to you. Oh. Oh, now it's up to me. But before, it was always you made the decisions. I know why you're taking this attitude on account of what I wrote. What are you talking about? You know, you know well, that... I do not know. What a... Oh, just a minute. The phone. Hello? Hello? Oh, yes. Yes, he's here. All right, I'll tell him. Get right away. Thanks for calling. 
That was your boss's secretary. Mr. Stevenson wants to see you right away. Oh, he found out about the dynamo. You better get down there. Come with me, Faye. <laughs> Riley, I can't do that. Who ever heard of a wife going with her husband to see his boss? What's the matter, you yellow? <laughs> hey, come with me. Here's the boss's office. Well, go ahead, not dear. Oh. Hope you don't hear it. Come in. Well, go on in, Peg. I'll stay out here. No, you go in? I'll wait. No, no, you come in with me. Come in, Riley. Come in. Oh, hello, Mrs. Riley. Come in. Hello, Mr. Stevenson. Riley, I wanted to see... Yeah, I know just what you're going to say, boss, but believe me, it was an accident. The dynamo... Oh, don't worry about that. That's been repaired. Riley, I wanted to talk to you about this letter you sent me for the suggestion contest. Letter? I sent a letter? Uh, yes, this one. Oh, that's the one you forgot this morning, Riley. It was addressed to your boss, so I had Junior deliver it. You... You had Junior... Hey, you mean you said Yes, you... Riley, and when I read this... Well, I know just I... what you're going to say, but don't get sore, Mr. Stevens. Sore? What for? Riley, this is one of the finest tributes any employer ever received. It is? Why, certainly. Do you know what that husband of yours said, Mrs. Riley? Uh, no, I didn't read it. Oh, you've got to hear this. Dear boss, for years I've been working just for you. You've always told me what to do and what to think. And naturally, I love that. Naturally, <laughs> After all, I'm just a nobody. I have no brains, but you're so smart. A regular genius. <laughs> Fine choice of words there, Riley. That's what I like about this note. It's so sincere. Oh, sure. Straight from the heart. <laughs> Listen to this next part. Uh, therefore, I think it's very kind of you to let me hang around all these years and let me have so much money every week, too. It's really too much. Why not? Just give me half. <laughs> yes, Riley, that's the kind of teamwork we want in this plant. Uh, that's what we need here, teamwork. Fifty <laughs> percent cut. Mm. You know, that's the first practical suggestion I got in this whole contest. But frankly, it's a little too radical. I know you'd understand, but I don't think the other men would. No, I don't think they would. Uh, my boy... Well, this kind of spirit, you'll go far. And to show my appreciation for your loyalty, I am not going to cut your salary in half. No, sir. I'm going to leave it exactly where it is. Oh, thank you, boy. Not at all. You're all right, Riley. And you're all right, too, boys. I like you, my boy. I like you, too. You're sweet, boy. <laughs> I just got some shopping to do. I need a new garbage pail. Well, I uh, mustn't keep you folks any longer. Yeah, i got to get back to the job. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's uh, 5.30. Why don't you take the rest of the day off? <laughs> oh, thanks, boys. Come on, Peg. Let's go. Goodbye, Riley. Goodbye, 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 Goodbye. Oh. Well, I got out of that one, eh? <laughs> You're proud of it? Well, sure. That letter... That wasn't a letter. That was a valentine. I never thought you'd turn out to be a bootlicker. What? Hey. I never heard such, such nauseating flattery in all my life. But, Dumplin', that wasn't flattery. So you were fooled, too. What do you mean? That letter was meant to be nasty. You know, sarcastic. Oh, you can't get out of this one, Riley. But why on earth should you send a nasty letter to your boss and, and risk your job? Only an idiot would do that. But I didn't send it to my boss. I wrote that letter to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Peg, I am an idiot. <laughs> and that's one of the smartest decisions I ever made. The Rodney's will be back in just a moment. Everyone goes for Prell, Procter & Gamble's Radiant Cream Shampoo in the handy tube. Here's what Mrs. F. E. Nauman of Venice, California, says about Prell. My husband says that Prell's a man's idea of a real shampoo. And regular Prell shampoos have done wonders toward controlling his unsightly dandruff. 
Now we're both Prell fans. Yes, both men and women go for Prell because Prell removes embarrassing dandruff quickly. Leaves hair radiantly clean, radiantly lovely. Bye, try. P R E L L L shampoo. Makes hair radiant, clean and bright. Not a bit of dandruff is in sight. Comes in a tube, handy too. P R E L L L shampoo. Well, I still can't believe it, Riley. How could you write a letter like that to your boss? Well, the fact is, I, I just. Oh, I might as well confess, Peg. That letter was meant for you. For me? Yeah. But it said to the big boss. Oh, yeah, I did it on purpose. Kind of cute, huh? <laughs> cute. Now, don't get sore, Peg. Now, I... look, let's get one thing straight right now. You have as much to say around here as I have. Oh, you're right, though. And I don't order you around or make you do anything you don't want to do. That's right, though. And I don't want to hear any more of this silly talk about me being your boss. Not one word. Okay, Dumplin', I promise. And don't worry, it won't happen again, boss. <laughs> Roger and Gamble invite you to join us again next week to hear The Life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. The Life of Riley is produced by Irving Brecker. In the factory. On the farm. In the home. Hey, Mom, where's the lava soap? Where's the lava soap? Wherever hands get extra dirty, you will find L-A-V-A, lava soap. Because in every inch of lava's snowy lather, 50,000 tiny scrubbers get the deep dirt from skin crevices between fingers, around knuckles and nails. Yes, lava gets the deep dirt and grime ordinary wash-ups miss. With lava, hand soiled by machine oil, grease, dirt, comes sparkling clean in 30 to 50 seconds. Mr. Julius Bonner of Cleveland, Ohio says, I thought the carbon and graphite I work with had me licked. Dirty hands? Man, nothing cleaned them. But a quick wash-up with lava does the trick. Gets my hands clean, real clean in a jiffy. Yet, lava is gentle enough even for children's tender skin. So get the soap that gets the dirt. Get lava soap. This is Ken Niles reminding you that for radiantly clean, lovely hair, get the shampoo in the tube. P-R-E-L-L, Prell Shampoo. Listen again next week when Prell brings you The Life of Riley. And now, stay tuned for Truth or Consequences. Good night. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Did you hear that? Come on, will you? Did I hear what? That whistle. <whistles> That's the Rinso White whistle. And Rinso means us. That's right. Rinso gets clothes Rinso White. And Rinso presents the Amos and Andy Show. <laughs> Rinso gets out stubborn dirt fast. Gives you a wash that's Rinso white. Rinso bright. Don't poke through another wash day with some lazy old bar soap. Put soapy rich Rinso suds to work on your wash. You'll do no back breaking, rubbing, or scrubbing with Rinso. Just as little as a ten minute soak. Then a few quick finger rubs and rinse. And if you're lucky enough to have a washer, remember it takes as little as a five minute run per load to give you a wash that's really clean. Next wash day, get Rinso to get clothes. A Rinso white wash with ease. A Rinso bright wash with safety. And now, our stars, Amos and Andy. Going in and out of business on an average of once a week over a period of years, you would imagine that Andy and the kingfish had just about covered the field. But you're wrong. For at the moment, they're in the Kingfish's office with the Kingfish selling Andy on a new business venture. Oh, I tell you, Andy, there's just one business in the whole world where they bring the money to you and hand it to you. And all you've got to do is to write a little something in the book. And that's a bank. Yeah? Well, I'll open up a bank with you. It's a deal. All right, all right. Shake hands. We'll open a bank. Yeah. Now, look here. I'll throw a coin in the air. Call it. Tail. Uh, it's heads. You as vice president. 
And you as the president? Right. Now, Andrew, uh, we're going to use the large hall for the bank building. Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing uh, we got to do is to build a big bird cage. For what? For the receiving teller to stay in. Yeah, well, how about the paying teller? Don't we need one for him, too? We ain't going to have no paying teller. Yeah. You don't hear the one-way streets, ain't you? Yeah. Well, this is a one-way bank. That's what <laughs> But it seemed like that we ought to let the people take some of their money. Don't you think so? And uh, a question like that shows why you is only the vice president around here. <laughs> now, listen, vice president, go down in the basement and you'll see a big sign down there that we use in the large hall when we give away that money at the party. Hmm. It says bank night. Now, throw off the word night and bring up what's left. Okay. Uh, now, let's see what equipment we've got to get you now. Stationery, blotters. Wet sponge to count the money fast. <laughs> yeah, I guess that about does it. Ain't much of the overhead in the banking business as I thought. Oh, me. Uh, come in. How do you do? Uh, very busy today, madam. Are you in charge? Uh, listen, madam, I ain't got much time for messing around. Is this the lecture bureau? I think this is the address they gave me over the phone. I done told you I'm busy. Why do people walk in here every time to get lost? Look, madam, you is lost. That's what you is. You is lost. Well, I'm sure this is the address they gave me, and I have the $50. Oh, uh, sit down, madam. Uh, you ain't lost. Uh... <laughs> this is the lecture bureau, isn't it? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This is the uh, lecture bureau, all right. Yes, ma'am. Then you remember what we discussed in our phone conversation. Oh, uh, the phone conversation. Oh, yeah, sure. I remember. Yeah, the conversation. Remember it very well, word for word. Uh, I remember I say hello, and then you say hello. And then we went on there, and then I say goodbye, and you say goodbye. Uh, the only thing that'll slip my mind is a little stuff between the hello and the goodbye there. That's that's <laughs> See, I'm so busy. Uh, let's go over it again. Well, as I told you, I'm Mrs. Bolton, the chairman of the Jersey City Woman's Club, and we're having a dinner Tuesday night at our club, and we want to hire a lecturer. Mm -hmm. We already have one prominent lecturer, but we want another one for the occasion. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing comes back to me now. Yeah, I remember that now. Well, you said you could get us a good speaker for $50. Oh, yeah, I'll get you a great speaker. Uh, uh, tell me, those, uh, what subject do you want him to lecture on again? Well, we would like the lecturer to speak on either the psychology of homemaking or politics. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my card with the address on it, and yeah. that will be Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Yeah. We'll have 125 women there. And of course, I'll give you the $50 right after the lecture. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll have a great speaker for you. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, goodbye. Yeah, I better write that down. Virology of homemaking. See why, see why. Well, I don't know what that means anyway. Or oh, politics. P O L L Y T I C K S. <laughs> now let's see. Uh, uh, well, Pres, old boy, here it is. The VP has got the sign right here. And uh, the bank is through. Well, we can hang this. Uh, what'd you say? I say the bank is through. Kingfish, you mean to say that in the three minutes I was getting the sign, we don't fail? <laughs> and, uh, I am proud to tell you that we are now a lecture bureau. Oh, we is, huh? Uh, tell me one thing, Kingfish. Oh, uh, what's that, brother? While I was out, was we in any business between the bank and the lecture bureau? <laughs> uh, no, Andrew, we don't need a, made a clean switch. Uh, well, that's great. I think I'll go over and talk to my gal. Save your breath, son. Tuesday, you were talking to 125 of them. Now let's listen to the Mystic Knights of the Sea Quartet sing Brother Bill. Me and Brother Bill went hunting Where'd you go, boy? Way up in eastern Maine On the choo-choo The reason we went way up there We thought we could shoot some game Whoa. Me and Brother Bill went hunting Ooh. Way in the middle of the night In the middle of the night the bear and the dog dog thing turned white. Woo! I dropped my gun. Ma! And the way I run. <laughs> Brother Bill said, Boy, what's the matter with you? They don't like me. He run some too. I ran so fast, they say. They couldn't catch me all day. Oh, 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 the way I ran across that field. They couldn't catch me with an automobile. Rip, 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 Promise to shoot at me. I heard those bullets sizzling and whistling through the trees. Went by my house and I thought I didn't have time to knock. Ran into a good track, me that I didn't have time to stop. Ran 
money to a windmill. Thought I'd get some wind. Didn't have a dime to pay for his so I had to ride again. Well, and so fast that night, he never touched the ground. Heard those birds in the tree sing Alabama bound. I'm going home, I'm all alone. From the bill said, boy, what's the matter with you? I don't like me, he'd run some. I ran so fast, they say, hey, you can catch me all day. you now, I can't make no speech. I'm scared. Yeah, but, uh, Andy, there's nothing to be scared about. Mm. Yeah, that's right, Andy. All your life you has been talking to gal. Yeah, but under certain conditions. Yeah, well, all right, Andy. Uh, whatever the conditions is, we'll see that there's the same at the lecture. Oh, don't be crazy, Kingfish. How are you going to get 125 women on one sofa? <laughs> Oh, look, now, uh, you can't back out of this thing. Now, you done signed a contract with me just a half hour ago agreeing to make the speech, and we each going to get $25. Hmm. Boy, that's a lot of money for making a speech, all right. Oh, look, Anna, you can talk on politics. Now, you know, you might say some line in your speech that will go down in history. Yeah, like what? Well, like the man that say, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, who was the man that say, give me... Uh, Say, uh, give me... Morgenthau. Oh, no. Oh, I know who it was. It was, it was Patrick Henry. Yeah, that's... He said, give me liberty or give me death. That's what it say. Yeah. Oh, Kingfish, I don't think Andy gonna have no reason to say nothing like that. Look, there... 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 there ain't there some other subject that Andy could speak on? Uh, politics don't seem to be his long suit. Yeah, that's right, Amos. Maybe I better get back to that other subject, the psychology of homemaking. Oh, no, no. Now, listen, Anna, listen. I, I know what we'll do. I know exactly what we'll do. We'll stick with the politics. Yeah. Now, the only thing is this. Now, get this in your head, will you? Okay. Go All ahead. right. Now, now, listen to me. Yeah. We want to know what you was talking about. Hmm. Now, the thing to do is to go over to the shortest barber shop. Now, barbers has always got customers there sitting in the chair, the customer getting a haircut, and while they're doing it, running off at the mouth, you see. Yeah, barber right. cutting his hair and everything. Yeah, right. So they request to use politics. Yeah. Now, barber's always talking politics to customers, so Shorty might know a lot that he can tell you. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's go over to Shorty's and see if he can help me with the speech. <laughs> So you see, Shorty, Anders got to give this speech on politics, and we figured that you might be able to help us. Yeah, you you, you come to the right man all right. I, I, I know it's my politics. Yeah. Well, good, good, Shorty, good. Uh, you really know your stuff, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah you, you take the last presidential election. Even before the votes was in, I, I knew that the next president would be... Uh, the, I, I, I kept track of the electrical vote. Uh, I, I confused the way the public was... Uh, I, 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 I know that the next person would be a... Uh, who won the thing? Uh, now, look, Shorty, if you was going to... Uh, hi, boy, what's going on here? What's going on? Oh, hello, Gabby. Hello, hello. Uh, Gabby Gibson, the lawyer. I say, uh, look here, Gabby. Uh, and they're going to deliver a political speech, and Shorty going to help him on the facts. You see. Shorty going to help you. <laughs> I'm the man that really knows politics, yes, indeed. Uh, now, now, wait a minute, Gabby. I'm the one that's going to help him. I, I know more about politics than you do. Oh, now, 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 Andy, keep your ears open. Sean, you don't know a thing about political situation, but I do. I challenge you right now to a political discussion. Yeah, that, that's okay with me. Uh, Andy, let's go over here now and get your pad and pencil out and take some notes on this thing. <laughs> okay, KJ. Yeah. If you know so much about politics, Shorty, when Congress meets Philadelphia down here in Washington and starts passing them new laws, in laws, out laws, and bylaws, you know what's going to happen then, don't you? Well, I. I... Answer the question. You know what's going to happen then, don't you? <laughs> Well, I, I, we I, got to have them taxes. We got to have them. That's what keeps the political monotony in uh, this gut. Well, yeah, but if they, if they let the people, the people, the, the people what? The people what? <laughs> well, if, 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 
they let the people, let the people, let the, the people what? The people what? Well, if they, if they let, the, let the people, let the people have the, the referendum on the, on the bicentennial of the past, there'd be no sales tax on, on the freedom of the, of the, of the, of the, the Philistines. <laughs> You. Don't you know they could never do nothing like that? Well, why, why couldn't they do it? If we ever done anything like that, then our financial redestruction subcommittee company would have to give us the 18 commitments along with their uh, <coughs> consumption. <laughs> and that would disrupt, disrupt the immigration to their uh, 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 capital punishment. Mm-hmm. And we need it. We got to have it. Oh, man, what are you talking about? What we need? <laughs> what, 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 what we really need is, 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 is what? Is what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Need is, 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 is the more time to the un- unemployment of, of the disagreement. <laughs> well, that, 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 that alone would, would, would put it, would give, you can't, but I, I, I would guess. <laughs> that is right there. <laughs> the same thing. You don't even know what you're talking about. We could never do nothing like that. Well, why, why couldn't they do if it? If we ever attempted to do something like that, then our domestic relations would cause our banks to swell up and bust with the soreness of the, of the bubbles. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's what it would do, <laughs> causing an unnecessary dispepsia of the agricultural uh, <coughs> inflammatory. Uh-huh. <laughs> and we ain't got it. <laughs> yeah, but wait a minute. Yeah, but has, has, has we got the public utensils to go on and disrupt the interstate farm and the postal marine? Hasn't we? Well, we have to. <laughs> if, if they ever did that, why, that, 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 would, that would put us on the basis of, uh, on, on the basis of, there you see, there it is right there, the basis, you see that? That is right there, you see, that, that would put us on the basis of, the basis of what? I would, hmm? <laughs> Of what? On the basis, that's what it is. The base, on the basis of, um, basis, that, uh, the basis. <laughs> what basis? <laughs> Why, the basis of, uh, uh, hmm? <laughs> the, the, the basis of what? Oh, uh, hold it, boys, oh, hold it there. Look here, I, I've been listening to this because you know, on politics for two minutes here. Yeah, well, did, did you learn anything, King? Uh, yeah, I learned that Ann there's going to have to make a speech on the sirology of homemaking. <laughs> Come on, Kingfish, let's go. Oh, wait a minute, Bob. We ain't through yet. Yeah, but we are. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Mm, what a mess. Come on, Andrew. Let's see if we can get a book on the sirology of homemaking. Yeah. Wait a minute, though. As long as I is here, I may as well go back on in there and get a shake. Let the people... Let the people what? 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 This ain't no time for a shave. Come on, Andrew. Let's go and get the seat ready. Rinso is made by an exclusive patented anti-sneeze process. And that's important. Yes, Rinso is 98% free of sneezy soap dust. No other granulated soap can make this claim. That's one big reason why I use Rinso. You bet. And Rinso gives you a Rinso white wash with ease, a Rinso bright wash with safety. No wonder women here, there, everywhere are singing. Rinso wash that's white as it can be. Rinso bright. P-R-I-G-H-T-S, Rinso keeps your color bright. It's a porter for a wash so white, here's great advice, you can't go wrong. Rinso white. Rinso white, happy little wash day song. You can have white clothes, dazzling Rinso white, washable colors, Rinso bright. Truly a wash to whistle and ring bells about. You'll see that for yourself on your very first Rinso wash day. So don't forget, get Rinso.
it sure was nice of you to get this book of speeches from the library. I don't know how you got it, but it was just what we needed, and it's going to help us a whole lot. Oh, yeah. We ought to get a good speech out of there for my lecture tomorrow night. Oh, yeah, fellas. You know, I went over to the library there. I got my wife's card, and I asked them for a book like this. In fact, uh, there's one in there, a speech in there somewhere, that just the one you wanted. It's called the... Uh, the, uh, the Psychology of Homemaking. Yeah. Oh, that's great, Emma. That's, that's exactly what we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, sure is. That's yeah. the thing. Uh, there's a speech in there on politics, too, if uh, you want to go back on the subject about politics and finances and things like that. Well, no, Amos, so I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, we've been talking it over, and we're going to stick to the other thing, that Psychology of Homemaking. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, uh, here's the speech book, fellas, and good luck to you. Yeah, let me have it, Jay. Let's see. Look through here, Anderson. Yeah, what is that? Let me see it. Yeah, here, just right here. Let's see. Sirology of homemaking on page 45. Let's turn over here. Here we are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, Sirology of homemaking by Winston Stewart. Who, who, who wrote the speech, you say? Uh, say here, the Sirology of homemaking by Dr. Winston Stewart. That's T-E-W-A-R-T. Yeah. Uh, listen to this. Listen to what it says. Yeah, yeah, read it. Read it. I want to hear this. Yeah, right. start off here by saying, uh... Homemaking. Homemaking is the art of rationalizing the objectivity of true psychology hmm. with the subjectivity of human emotional responses. Yeah. Oh, Andy, this is great stuff that rationalizes the objectivity. <laughs> there, there's some big stuff there. How you know? Yeah, well, he could memorize the whole speech. Uh, Andy, what you could do is take it and study it and memorize it word for word. And give a good lecture. Yeah, but I don't know what them big words mean. I wonder what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, what does you care what you're saying? You just say the big words, open your mouth, let them figure the words out. That's all you got. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, you could memorize it just the way it's written there, Andy. Yeah, that's a great idea. And listen, tomorrow, Andy, me and you will go to the dinner at the Women's Club. The noted lecturer and his noted manager. Yeah. Now, let's go over this thing again here. Sort of familiarize yourself with it. Say yeah. here... Homemaking is the art of rationalizing. Dr. Stewart, it certainly is a pleasure to have you here as one of the speakers tonight. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Bolton. We are hoping that our little affair will be a big success, particularly because the husbands of all the women are attending for the first time. Oh, yes, I see. I suppose you're going to make your speech on the psychology of homemaking. Yes, I am. Well, it's a very famous speech. I know it's been reprinted in several books, and I just can't wait to hear you deliver it, Dr. Stewart. Thank you very much. Now, why don't you go in the answer room there and take off your coat? The other speaker's in there with his manager. Just introduce yourself. We'll be ready in just a few moments. You know, I'll do just that, Mrs. Bolton. Thank you. How do you do, gentlemen? Oh, how you do, sir? Uh, you the other speaker, huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, just hang your coat over there on the clothes tray. Oh, thank you. I will. Yeah, well, then, uh, from the looks of that fellow, you won't have no trouble doing better than him. No, I'll make him look sick. <laughs> and, uh, you got the whole thing memorized, ain't you? Word for word. Gentlemen, I don't think we've met before. Uh, no, my name is Stevens. Uh, this is Professor Brown. How do you do? I'm Dr. Stewart. Uh, pardon me, my left ear been jamming up on me just there. Uh, what did you say your name was? Dr. Stewart. Uh, Kingfish. Uh, take it easy, and it couldn't be. <laughs> uh, tell me, Dr. Stewart, uh, uh, how do you spell your name? That's uh, S-T-U-A-R-T, isn't it? No, no, I spell it S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Take it easy, Anna. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, tell me this, Doctor. Uh, did you ever write anything that was, uh, well, ever printed in a book? Oh, yes. One of my speeches has been printed many times. So long, coincidence. <laughs> and uh, uh, tell me this, Doctor. Are you speaking here tonight, of course? Uh, just wondering. <laughs> What is the first few words of your speech tonight? Uh, well, I start off by saying homemaking is the art of rationalizing the objectivity of true psychology. That's all, brother. <laughs> all right, Dr. Stewart, we're ready for you now. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Bolton. See you in a little while, gentlemen. 
Kingfish, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, well, you can't get out of here. Who can't? I was leaving. No, you ain't. Now, look here. I got a contract with you where you agree to make a speech and we get $50 for it. Now, if you try to get out of this thing, I'll take you to the highest court in the land and I'll sue you up one side and down the other. Yeah, you just gonna have to switch to some other kind of speech. Well, K- Kingfish, I, 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 I'm too nervous. Look at me. Look, I, I, I'm shaking like a leaf. Yeah, well, stop shaking and push them eyes back in your head. Oh. Yeah, now, look here. I got this book here with me that Amos got from the library. Now, uh, and like he said, there's another speech in here on politics and government finances and, and, the, and the subject that you was going to speak on in the first place. That's exactly what's here. Uh, Kingfish, my, 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 my head is swimming. I, I was too nervous. Now, look here. Look here. I'll be sitting right next to you at the speaker's table. I'll hold the book open in my lap and I'll whisper to you exactly what to say. I'll give you pointers. Oh, Kingfish, I can't. And uh, look here. We got a contract. Now, look. All you got to do is remember how to start out. Just start out by saying, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. Oh, me. I, I'm getting nervouser and nervouser. I don't know what I'm saying. And look here, I'll have the book open and I'll tell you exactly what to say for me. That is why I say that true happiness in marriage begins and ends with the home. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my remarks on the psychology of homemaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stewart. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our second speaker of the evening, Professor Andrew Brown. Yeah, there you go, Andy. Now stop shaking. Yeah, oh, oh, hold that book open. Here I go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. When I was a little boy, uh, uh, Kingfish, uh, start over, start over. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 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 Kingfish. Uh, talk about finances. Uh, speaking of finances, you take the finances of today and you take the finances of the past hundred years. And when you t- take them all, you has got them. <laughs> uh, uh, Kingfish. Uh, talk about politics. Uh, what, uh, what kind of ticks? Polly. Uh, speaking of the ticks on the poly, uh, ladies... Uh, your shirt tail is out. Your shirt tail is out. Uh, Kingfish. Uh, King start King. over, start over. Uh, 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 oh, call me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here. Yeah, get in that ante room. They are ashamed of you. Well, I done the best I could. I told you I ain't had no business making that speech. Yeah, stand up there for 30 minutes in front of them people in the next room there, acting like a fool. Oh, I was through with you. The people laughed at you. Well, it was your fault for getting me up there. My fault? Yeah. You ain't gonna blame this on me. I don't want no more to do with you. And as far as our contract is concerned, here. I stand it up. And right in your face, there it is. Mm. Yeah, you ain't gonna blame me for this. Yeah. Well, well gentlemen... Yeah, wait a minute, Mr. Bolton. There's the man right there. I ain't got no more to do with it. No more. Oh, Mr. Stevens. Yeah, don't, 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 don't do nothing to me. He's your man right there. Tell him everything, will you? Professor Brown, as you know, tonight was an important meeting. The husbands were invited. Uh, yes, ma'am. After Dr. Stewart finished his boring speech, it was a pleasant surprise to have a comedy speaker like you with us. And here's a check for $50. <laughs> and Andy will be back in just a moment. Rinso takes the drudgery out of dishwashing. Mmm, it's a work saver. Rinso gets the dishes done in far less time. Mmm, it's a time saver. Yes, those soapy rich suds go after. Grease, chase, clinging food particles right off. Knives and forks, plates and platters. Before you know it, dishwashing's done. For plenty of help on every soap and water job around the house, try Rinso. Rinso's easy on your hands, too. Yes, ladies, for dishwashing, for house cleaning, for a wash that's Rinso white and Rinso bright, get Rinso. And now, here are Amos and Andy. Ladies and gentlemen, on every battlefront the world over, the Red Cross is doing one of the finest jobs in history. Now, we're not asking you to give because we know you want to give. We're merely reminding you that the Red Cross needs money very badly and needs it now. Make your contributions generous. And make it now. 
Good night, folks. Good night. Be sure to be with us next Friday evening at this same time when the makers of Rinso will again present the Amos and Andy Show. Next week, the Kingfish and Henry Van Porter try to cash in on a new sales job of Andy's. Don't miss the surprises in store for all of them. This program is broadcast to our armed forces all over the world. This is Harlow Wilcox saying good night to all of you from all of us. It's mild and gentle, yet it gets you extra clean. That's Life Boy. A daily bath with Life Boy gives you all over lasting protection against B.O. Just hop into a Life Boy bath, and you can be sure that you'll get protection that lasts. Yes, it's swell to be extra clean. Life Boy clean. Remember, Life Boy is the only soap especially made to stop B.O. National Broadcasting Company. Well, this is Bill Goodwin speaking for Lever Brothers, ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Swan, the new white floating soap. It's Tuesday night again, and that means another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, their guest Eddie Cantor, and Paul Whiteman and his music. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, George is a very happy man this morning. He's on his way downstairs now, bubbling over with good cheer, never dreaming that fate is about to slug him. You see, he's forgotten completely that this is the day on which Gracie's club, the Beverly Hills Uplift Society, meets at his house. Well, here he comes like a lamb to the slaughter. Sitting on top of the world and rolling along and rolling. Hey, Gracie! Gracie! Oh, hi, sweetheart. Sweetheart! Ah, oh, bless her heart. Probably out working in the garden. Hope she left the morning paper in the library. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. It can't be the club. Not on a lovely day like this. <laughs> Were you looking for me, dear? Yes, I was. In spite of all I've said, you brought those dames over here again. Oh, yes. And uh, we're having a marvelous meeting. Did you hear old girls laughing? <laughs> Vicki Gruskin just told us the funniest joke. Oh, she's so witty. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> I'll tell it to you in her own words. I know you'll appreciate it. <laughs> Two Irishmen named Pat and Mike met each other on the street one day and... <laughs> <laughs> well, go on. <laughs> We laughed so hard that we never heard the rest of it. <laughs> oh, honestly, just she ought to be on the stage. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Gracie, all I ask is this. Today, please make the meeting short. Yes, dear. And I all right, girls, all right. Girls, come to order, please. The Beverly Hills Uplift Society's third semi-annual meeting of this month will now continue. Our charming secretary will read the minutes of the last meeting. Girls, our secretary. <laughs> Thank you, girls. The, um, the last meeting of the Beverly Hills Uplift Society was held on the sidewalk outside of Mrs. Bagley's house at the request of Mr. Bagley. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Bagley refused for quite some time to grant his request, but in the end, Mr. Bagley convinced her. By the time the meeting was over, she felt much better, and the swelling had practically disappeared. <laughs> uh, by the way, Clara, is your husband still annoyed with you? I don't know, Gracie. He won't be allowed visitors until tomorrow. Oh, I see. Uh, the society then voted on its offices for the coming year. 
And Mrs. George Burns was re-elected our president. Oh, <laughs> well. the, um, the election was very close. In fact, it was a tie. And your president, pro tem, Mrs. George Burns, had to cast another vote to break the tie. <laughs> the, uh, the final score, Mrs. George Burns received two votes and all you other girls one vote apiece. <laughs> now, girls, did you all bring in your waste kitchen back today? You know, the government needs the waste back to make bombs and bullets. Oh, oh yes, yeah, I did. Oh, that's fine. Now, turn it over to Tootsie and she'll take it over to Louie, the butcher. Well, Tootsie, why do you give us two cents a pound more than the butcher does? Aren't you losing money on it? Yes, but Louie is so handsome. <laughs> And he says that as soon as I brought in 40,000 pounds, he'll take me to see Gentleman Jim. Oh. <laughs> That's nice. Now, girls, I have a wonderful surprise for you. I found a woman who's just dying to join our club. Oh, oh what is that wonderful? Lovely. Well, she's a lovely woman, and her name is Ida Cantor. Is she married? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, um, I, I believe... I believe her husband's name is Teddy or Freddy or something like that. Now, Gracie, you know it's the rule of our club never to take in a new member unless we know something about her husband. Oh, we'll investigate him, all right. I'll tell you what. I'll ask George if he knows anything about him. Well, have you broken up that silly meeting? Well, not quite, but it won't be long. You can help us if you will. How? Well, we want a little information. Uh, do you know a fellow named uh, Freddy Cantor? Freddy Cantor? Or maybe it's Teddy. It's one of those names that sound like it belongs to a college boy. Uh, do you do you by any chance mean Eddie Cantor? Yeah, it could be that. Uh, do you know him? Know him? Of course I know him. Well, what do you know about him? Well, he's a very swell guy. He has five lovely daughters and... Five uh, daughters? Yes. How many sons? Uh, no sons. Oh, just five daughters? That's right. Wouldn't you think he'd try taking from a different doctor? Uh, maybe, maybe the doctor had a contract. Oh. Oh. Uh, why did you want to know about Eddie Cantor? Well, his wife, Ida, wants to join our club. Ida Cantor in your club? Yes. Gracie. Hiya, George. Hi, Gracie. Hello, Hello Bill. Uh, well, Gracie, here's the welcome song for Ida Cantor. I just finished writing it. Oh, good. You want to hear it, George? Oh, no, thanks. I've got a water friend of mine. He's uh, going to be hit with a club. I'll see you later. Well, uh, come on, Bill. The girls are waiting. Okay. <laughs> oh, girls, girls, girls. Look who's here. Bill Goodwin. Oh. Oh, girls. Well, that's not much of a reception. Come on. Give them a real Beverly Hills Uplift Club welcome. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, Gracie, you know, I've always wondered, and now I know. Know what, Bill? How Betty Grable would feel on a battleship. Oh. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, never mind. Uh, girls, I have that song you wanted, the one to sing in honor of Ida Cantor. Would you like to try it out? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, come on, gather around the piano. Oh, oh, now, quiet, mind. quiet, everybody. Here we go. I know, sweet apple. Swan's the new white floating soap that gives you mild, pure suds. Takes one swish to wash a dish, and it's great for washing duds. Because Swan gives you heaps and heaps of baby gentle lather, sure it makes gobs of household jobs quicker for mither and father. And Swan is mighty kind to your hands, as pure as the finest Castiles. Why, it's just the soap. Bill, Bill, don't you think the song ought to say a little more about Ida? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's all about Ida from now on. It is? Oh, sure, Gracie. We even sing about how Ida goes to the store to take advantage of the sale many dealers are now running on Swan Soap. Buy three bars and save. You really save, Ida. Well, I, I don't know. I'd rather not put that in the song, Bill. Well, okay, Gracie. I'll, uh, I'll leave it out. Oh, all right, girls. All together on the finish. Because I love you, Ida. Please, please. Go to your dealer. Because I love you, Ida. Please, please. Buy three and save. Look for the green wrapper with the white swan on the front. That's a mild and a pure. This is Paul White. Seventeen years ago, I commissioned Ferdy Grove Fay to write the Mississippi Suite. And from it comes one of our newest song hits, David. Here it is, with the six hits, 
and a miss. George has just arrived at Eddie Cantor's house to warn him that Ida is joining the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. Yes? Oh, hello, George. Oh, hi, Eddie. <laughs> oh, uh, George, uh, come on in. Come on. Sit down, George. What's on your mind? Well, I'll tell you. There's a club, uh... Oh, by the way, is Ida here? No, she hasn't been home for four days. Four days? Oh, it's all right. She's just out shopping for a pound of bacon. <laughs> Go ahead, George. What were you saying? Well, you know, Gracie belongs to this club called the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. <laughs> Does Gracie belong to that outfit? Yes, yes. You poor sucker. <laughs> Any man who'd let his wife join that organization ought to have his head examined. <laughs> You know, Eddie, that's why I came over to see you. Your wife. I know. My wife is different. But that's because I've trained her, George. When I give orders, Ida jumps. When I say to her, Ida, get your coat off this bed so I can make it, she gets it off. Uh, you're, the, you're the boss in your house. You said it. When I tell Ida to move a chair, she moves it. And believe me, she doesn't put it back until I'm through sweeping under it. I know my wife. <laughs> Look, um, I hate to say... Don't this. be ashamed to bring your personal problems to me, George. After all, you and I have a lot in common. Mm. I'm in show business. You're in show business. I've been fairly successful. You've been fairly successful. I've got a certain amount of talent. Gracie's got a certain amount of talent. <laughs> Eddie, uh, I'm going to try once more. That's the spirit, son of a... Oh. give you a little tip about why. There's nothing like a good old-fashioned spanking to keep them in line. I know. You spank, Ida? You bet your life I spank. Of course, not so much anymore. Not so much anymore. My bones don't knit like they used to. Eddie, Eddie, for the last time, Gracie's club... George, you're a dope to let Gracie belong to that club. Hmm. You, Daddy! Yeah, Janet! Daddy, did my welding tools come? They're in the closet. 
That's daughters for you, George. She's a welder. One's a whack. Another's a wave. One's studying to be a doctor. The other's working in a law office. Now do you see why I'd like a son? I want somebody around to help with the housework. Where were we, George? <laughs> What were we saying, uh, Well, you were saying I was a dope. Oh, yes. Now, if I were married to Gracie, I'd have her eating out of my hand. And what's more, I'd throw those club members right out of the house. Uh, Eddie, it just happens that the club is meeting at my house right now. Yeah? Would you like to come over and show me how you'd get Gracie to eat out of your hand and how you'd get rid of the club women? You bet I would. I'll turn those girls out in two minutes and say that'll be a new record for me. What do you mean? It took me 30 years to turn out the last five girls. <laughs> Well, here we are, Eddie. Fine. Now, where's that club meeting? Lead me to him. Well, just open that door. <laughs> Sounds like breakfast at my house. <laughs> well, go on, Eddie. Break it up. Don't rush me. Don't rush me. Oh, George, I'm so glad you're home. The funniest looking little man just stuck his head in. Yep. Oh, oh, there he is again. <laughs> Gracie. Gracie, this is Eddie Cantor. Who? I am Eddie Cantor. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> then you do know who I am. Well, of course. You're Ida Cantor's husband. But, well, look, most people say that Ida is my wife. Well, naturally. If you're her husband, how could she avoid it? <laughs> Eddie, make a read out of your hand. Don't rush me. Uh, Mr. Cantor, your being here is a coincidence. The girls were just talking about you. They were? Yes. Come on into the meeting. Watch how I handle them, George. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, girls, girls, please. Please, let's come to order now. Now, you know what we were just talking about. <laughs> well, here he is. What, uh, what are they whispering? What, what are they saying about me? Well, now, girls, it isn't quite to whisper things like that about our guests. Speak right up. Uh, Gracie. Yes, Clara. Tell him to close his eyes. I keep thinking of a place with nothing on it but two olives. <laughs> uh, Mr. Cantor, please close your eyes. Now, just a minute. Listen, ladies. Gracie, are you sure his name is Cantor? Oh, yes, Tootsie. Why? <laughs> he looks just like Mr. Miggs, the only man who ever proposed to me. <laughs> oh, but Tootsie, we all know where poor Mr. Miggs is. Well, I thought he might have escaped. <laughs> You're killing them, Eddie. You're killing them. Just give me time, George. Now, quiet, girls. Ladies, if my wife belonged to a club like this, sit I... Sit down, Mr. Cantor. What? I said sit down. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> what a tiger. Look, I'm going to ask you some questions. First, Mr. Cantor, your financial status. Are you wealthy? Wealthy? Are you kidding? Look, look at my coat. Coffee stains. <laughs> well, that's nice. Now, uh, Mr. Cantor, what business are you in? What business am I in? I sell pickles. Oh, wholesale or retail? <laughs> I'm on the radio. I'm a comedian. Oh, really? A radio comedian? Oh, well, yes. Oh. I do it? <laughs> I do it? Gracie, don't you recognize me? I'll give you a hint. I'll pop my eyes out. Look. That ain't the way I hear it? <laughs> I better pop them back. Gracie, look at my face. I'd regust it? <laughs> No, Gracie, don't you know my voice? I got a problem, Mr. Anthony? <laughs> if you knew Susie like I know Susie, oh, 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 what a girl. There, does that give you an idea about me? Well, it certainly doesn't. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> oh, wait till Ida hears about her. No, 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 no. Listen. I'd love to spend... One hour with you. Well, Gracie? He is a wolf, isn't he, girl? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, this is amazing. He certainly doesn't look like a ladies' man. Or any other kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, girls, you know what I always say. You can't cover a judge by a book. <laughs> George, does she always say that? Only when it rains. Well, girls, Doug, you've all heard and seen Mr. Cantor. Shall we vote on our new member now? Oh, yes, I think so. uh, any discussion? Well, I'd like to say that if that unfortunate woman has to see and hear him every day, she certainly deserves some pleasure. What who? What is this? What goes on here? All in favor, say aye. 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 Good, it's unanimous. Well, you can go now, Mr. Cantor. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Would you mind telling me what you girls just voted on? Oh, no, not at all. We just made your wife a member of this club. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Here is Jimmy Cash singing There Will Never Be Another You. There will be many other nights like this, and I'll be standing here with someone new. But there will never be another you. There will be other lips that I may kiss. But they won't thrill me like yours used to do. Yes, I may dream a minute. that Ida had joined the Beverly Hills Uplift Society, he knew that something drastic had to be done. So he sent for Paul Whiteman and me to come over to George's house. Boys, I've got a great idea to break up this club of Gracie's. We fellows will hold a meeting just like one of theirs. Then when Gracie sees how silly it is, no more club. Mm. <laughs> Eddie, that's a swell idea. You mean you want us to act like a bunch of dizzy dames? That's the idea, Paul. You see, that club is really a threat to all of us. You see, fellas... We're all married men, and there's no telling whose wife will be next. Well, uh, I don't have a wife. I'm not married. And we make those girls see how... You're not married? No. <laughs> well, have a cigar, son. Why don't you come over to the house and meet my daughter, Janet? <laughs> well, uh, th thank you, Eddie. I'm very anxious to meet her. He's anxious. <laughs> come on, Eddie. Let's get started. You have Just an idea. Well, come on. Just a minute. Just a minute. You make a fairly comfortable living, don't you, son? Uh, oh, sure. You see, uh, I represent Swan, the new white floating soap that's as pure as the finest Castile soap. Pure as an angel, gentle as a summer breeze. Sounds like a good job. Oh, oh, it Eddie, is. It's Eddie, Eddie, what about the club? What about Ida? Look, George, I've been trying to get Ida out of the club for ten minutes. I've been trying to get my daughter out of the house for ten years. Let me alone, will you, please? <laughs> what were you going to say, my son, I hope? Well... <laughs> I was, I was just going to tell you that Swan is so pure that it's the perfect soap for bathing a little baby. It agrees with even a baby's tender skin. Already he's thinking of baby. <laughs> and, and, and Eddie, yes. if, if Swan is that pure and mild, well, you know it's great for your bath or shower. George, can I use your tub for a minute? This boy is so persuasive, I feel look, very... Look, look, Eddie. <laughs> this is going far enough. We've we got to get busy. Gracie may come down any minute. Just one thing. Bill, my son... If you sell lots of swan soap, maybe the sponsor gives you a raise. They do that, you know. Well, uh, maybe. And Janet needs a new hat. Sell it, sell it, sell it. Go ahead, sell it. Well, uh, <laughs> always remember that you can break swan in two with a flick of the wrist. Then you can use half in the kitchen for dishes and housework, and the other half in the bathroom for your hands and face. Well, that's... Hey, the... hey, hey, break it up, break it up. Here comes Gracie. All right, I'll talk to you later, son. Mm. Now, remember, boys, we've got to be a bunch of daffy dames. We've got to make Gracie break up that club. Okay, stop gabbing. Okay. Well, 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 what are you all doing here? We're about to hold our club meeting, and we're delighted to have you as our guest. And Gracie, you watch. We conduct our meetings exactly the way you do yours. Don't we, boys? Oh, oh yes, yes, we do. I love going down to the store Boys, please come to order. Paul Whiteman, you're always whispering. What is it now? What do you want? Well, if you must know. <laughs> I was... 
I was telling William that with this rubber shortage, I don't know where to get my girdle. <laughs> well, girdle or no girl, just pull yourself together. Now, <laughs> as your president, it is my privilege to open another meeting of the Beverly Hills Downtrodden Society. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Now, I'm going to read the meeting of the last uh, meeting. The last, the last meeting, the minutes of the last meeting is as follows. The Beverly Hills Downtrodden Society was held at the home of Mr. Paul Whiteman. Mr. Whiteman prepared a delicious light luncheon for four, but as usual, he ate it before the other three arrived. <laughs> it's, uh, it's no wonder all the boys call him Mr. Five by Five. Oh, huh. Oh, five. <laughs> Oh, he started it. I did not. He started it. You started it. You started it. Why me. don't you two make up? Well, if he wants to make up, let him say A. I won't say A till you say B. All right, B. All right, A. <laughs> Boys, please. Please, fella, please. Remember our guest. Gracie is liable to walk out of here disgusted and break up her own club. Won't you, Gracie? Well, no, I, I think your meeting is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, don't you think it's kind of silly? Well, our club was a little silly when it started, but look at us now. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, more minutes, more meeting. Leave it to me, George. Well, boys, back to the minutes. Mr. Goodwin made a motion that our next meeting be held outdoors on the corner of Hollywood and Vine, but the motion was voted down. It was very mean of you, too. Well, we older boys saw no reason why we should get rheumatism on that windy corner just because Mr. Goodwin likes to watch the girls getting on street cars. <laughs> I never have any fun. Oh, you do, too. No, I no don't. Cross I am not. Boys, boys, please, boys. <laughs> Bella. <laughs> Grace, you'll think we're a bunch of old silly willies. Oh, no, no. Well, I can't believe this club has just started. You boys sound like you've been doing this all your lives. <laughs> Eddie, it's no use. We're not getting nowhere. Don't worry. We'll break it down. All right, boys. We'll now hear a financial report from our treasurer, my son, William Goodwin. Oh, let's hear the report. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, after the last meeting, I started for the bank with our club fund, $15. And in front of the palladium, a gorgeous blonde said, how do? I said, how do? Gene Krupa's music was wonderful, and the club now has 83 cents. <laughs> I do say to myself, this is embarrassing. Now I know Gracie won't want to have anything to do with our club or any other club. Will you, Gracie? Well, you mean your total assets are 83 cents? Yeah. Isn't that awful? Awful? Well, that's 80 cents more than we've got. <laughs> Eddie, it's no use. I not give me, up. Not me. I've got one left I can't miss. We close the meeting by reciting the pledge of the Beverly Hills Downtrodden Society. Now, all together, boys... Oh, oh downtrodden down society of Beverly Hills, Hills. We, we are thy sons, Eddie, Paul, George, and Bill. When, when business, business is good or when business is rotten, we'll, we'll always be faithful and true and downtrodden. <laughs> Gracie, Gracie, what are, you, what are you crying about? Oh, George, that was the most beautiful thing I ever heard. <laughs> Well, that does it. All right, Gracie, stop crying. Stop crying. Look, Gracie, we staged this whole thing for you. This club is silly. We don't know how to run a club. So we're breaking this one up. Does that give you an idea what we want you to do with your club? Well, it certainly does. You see, George? Thanks, Eddie. We girls will be glad to make you boys members of our club. <laughs> Wait a minute. You can't do that. We're men. Well, don't worry about it. We'll make you all honorary women. Oh! <laughs> Well, I have just a second, so I'm going to suggest that you start using Swan for your dishes. Use it because it gives you all the suds you could ask for faster than you'll get them from any floating soaps. Sure, but use it, too, because Swan is so easy on your hands. It's got to be. It's purer than the finest Castile. Believe me, money can't buy a purer soap than Swan. And that's a proved fact. And now, Gracie... Oh, well, Bill, I'm sorry we're a little late, but good night, everybody, and thanks, Eddie. The makers of Swan, the new white floating soap, join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in again next week, same time. Remember, Swan now brings you two of radio's top shows. 
George Burns and Gracie Allen every Tuesday night. The Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou over another network. Now until next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying, Well, I swan, how about you? Try spy. You'll find the baking you turn out fluffy and light. Try spy. You're sure to hear your family shout. What a delight. Pork cake, pie, donuts, a thing to fry. Try spy. What's that you say you're going to try today? Why, sure. Try spy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting.